Well, hello. Uh, uh, I guess we are live right now. Uh, well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's 3 p.m. Brasilia time, and we start now the first Mind Brazil Brainstorms. Uh, we are being transmitted live on YouTube uh, on behalf of the organizing committee. I want to welcome, first welcome our guests here uh, and all the public watching us live on YouTube right now. And please, if you are on YouTube, uh, please subscribe to our channel. Uh, Mind Brazil Brainstorms was conceived by a group of Brazilian philosophers, including me, uh, I am Marco, uh, and my colleague Gustavo Leo Toledo from the Federal University of São João del Rey. Uh, Gabriel Mograbi and Rodrigo Gouveia uh, from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, and Samuel Bellini Leite from the State University of Minas Gerais. Uh, this is the first of a series of quarterly online roundtables uh, with a special target. It's going to be Joe Levin, this first one, uh, and a few hand-picked debaters. Uh, the idea is to put together top international and Brazilian philosophers to talk philosophy of mind. The next edition will happen in three months uh, in August. The specific date as well as the next target and debaters will be announced shortly. We are about to confirm that. Uh, before we start, uh, there is a sad notice. It's a very sad notice. Uh, Umberto Maturana, the Chilean uh, biologist and philosopher just passed away yesterday. Uh, he was very influential in the whole philosophy scene in South America. So that's a very sad notice. I couldn't uh, be silent about that here. Uh, well, let's move on. Before we start, uh, uh, and on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I want to thank our guests uh, for accepting our invitation and for being here now. Thank you very much to each one of you. Uh, it's an immense pleasure and honor to have you all here. Uh, I'm going to introduce now each one of you, starting with our target, Joseph Levin. Uh, Levin is a professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst uh, and has been a leading, a leading figure in this broad field of philosophy of mind, cog science, metaphysics, uh, since at least the early 1980s, uh, when he published his well-known paper on the explanatory gap, right? Uh, he probably doesn't know that. I'm pretty sure he doesn't. Uh, but I met him personally for the first time. I met him again in Rio. That was a few years ago. Uh, not, not a few years, but seven years ago. But 10 years ago, I met him for the first time in Austin, Texas. He was there to, to give a talk. And I was just one of the grad students at the back of the room, but I was there, I remember very much. And I remember that he was, on that occasion, introduced by, I think, Josh Dever. I'm not sure, I think that was him, who introduced Professor Levin, saying that he was a particularly clever philosopher who managed to build a lifelong career as a professional philosopher out of a gap. Uh, and I, I remember that. That's pretty much true. There is, of course, much more than gaps in his work throughout this last four decades, uh, including, you know, a whole lot of papers and two books. I actually have them here. The Purple Haze, the first, and this most recent one, right? Quality and Content, published in 2018. Uh, Joe Levin, thank you for accepting our invitation. We are deeply honored, really. And uh, we couldn't have a first, a best target for our, the, for the first edition of Mind Brazil Brainstorms. So thank you. And before he starts talking, I'm going to present each one of the debaters, right? So I'm going to follow alphabetical order, starting with Charles Seward, uh, who is Robert Allen and Catherine Dunleavy Hayes, Chair in Humanities, Professor of Philosophy at Rice University in Houston, Texas. Uh, Professor Stewart has written extensively on you know, consciousness, perceptual experience, introspection. I saw some stuff on introspection, uh, many other things, right? Thank you very much, Charles, for being here too. Uh, 
the uh, the uh, Diana quote uh, you can't see she here uh, she may appear we we don't know she said uh, a few hours ago that she will be here but she has a health condition right now she was hospitalized and she just went back home this morning uh, but she said that she's gonna make all possible efforts to be here today with us uh, and I hope she can if she can't, I want to thank anyways, because I mean, she showed so much, uh, uh, she wanted so much to be here. She sent a lot of messages. She, she, she was hospitalized, that's, that's something. So it, it, the, her effort to be here is something that I, I appreciate a lot. And we, the, in the organizing uh, committee, we appreciate a lot. Uh, I'm gonna introduce her anyway, because if she shows up, you already know her. So Diana Couto, she is a PhD candidate at, at the University of Barcelona, uh, and she's writing a dissertation on phenomenal concepts. Uh, I have this hope, I don't know why, that she's gonna get this gap closed once and for all. Uh, I don't know, I think she promises that somewhere. Uh, Diana, uh, well, if, you, if she uh, shows up, it's gonna be a, an immense pleasure to have her here. Uh, next one, Martin. Nida Hummelin uh, is professor. I met him in Rio too, I remember, in the conference organized by Wilson Mendonça seven years ago. Uh, but Martin, professor at the University of Freiburg in Switzerland. She has an extensive work on philosophy of mind, epistemology, philosophy of language. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to have you here too, Martin. Uh, Rodrigo Gouveia, the other debater, is uh, an assistant professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, he works mainly, you know, mind, metaphysics, uh, intentionality, physicalism. He was a colleague of mine at the University of uh, São João del Rey, but now he's in Rio, uh, and one of the organizers of this event. So be welcome, Rodrigo. Uh, and uh, Terry Horgan is uh, a emeritus uh, professor at the University of Arizona. He has published extensively too on mind, metaphysics, logic, uh, epistemology, metaethics, uh, a leading figure, I would say, and it's a great honor to have you here with us. Thank you, Terry. And uh, finally, Wilson Mendonça, uh, who's a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, by the way, the C with an accent is pronounced like a double S in Portuguese, so it's Mendonça. Uh, this, by the way, reminds me of a, uh, a story. Uh, when I just moved to Austin, Texas to do my PhD, uh, it was a very hot summer day. You know how hot summer is in Texas. And I saw this smoothie house right off campus. And as I walked in this house, I to my surprise, I saw they had acai smoothie in the menu. And I was like, oh, I can't believe it. Acai is this little fruit from the Amazon region. I love it. And so I, I but then I realized that it was written in the menu without the accent in the C. So I wondered, like, huh, how do they pronounce it here in Texas, right? And I thought maybe something like acai, right? And so I came to the counter and asked the guy, uh, you know, an acai smoothie, please. And the guy corrected me, looking as if I was some sort of stupid. And he was like, oh, it's a Portuguese word. It's pronounced acai. And I was like, hey, hold on, right? Wait a minute. I mean, I just came all the way from Brazil to be lectured on how to pronounce a Portuguese, guy, a Portuguese word by this Texan guy, right? And I was like, look, if you want it to be pronounced correctly, why don't you spell it correctly? <laughs> and the guy looked at me puzzled. But yeah, that's it, right? I was, there is an accent in the C, and by the way, another accent in the I at the end. So otherwise it's Akai in Portuguese. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, I'm just telling that story so you remind that his name is Wilson Mendonça. And Professor Mendonça works on philosophy of mind and metaethics. He, I think Mendonça played, he still plays a crucial role, uh, a formative role in Brazil. A lot of people in my generation, uh, 
uh, doing philosophy of mind in Brazil right now, they were uh, very much influenced by, by Mendonça and uh, including many of the organizers of this event. So uh, I don't think this very event will even exist without the work of Professor Mendonça in Brazil. So it's a, definitely a great pleasure to have you here, Wilson, you're welcome. Uh, and this is the last one, right? So enough for introductions. Uh, I'm gonna go through the rules of the debate just to make sure you're all on the same page, right? Uh, here is how it's gonna work. Joe is gonna make a short opening statement and after that, I'm going to follow, again, alphabetical order. So the first one is going to be Charles Seward, uh, followed by, uh, actually, I'm going to skip Martin. <laughs> I'm going to have Rodrigo Gouveia, second one. Martin is going to be the third one. Uh, and then uh, Terry Horgan, and finally, Wilson Mendonça. Uh, they are going to, each one of you, uh, you're going to lead the turn of the debate. So. When the first turn starts, the first debater, who is, is going to be Charles, uh, is going to pose a question. You're going to have up to 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes to ask your question to the target, to Joe. And he's going to reply. You can, you know, the discussion can go back and forth for a while. And any other debate who wants to join in the debate can just ask me in the chat for a follow up. Just write F in the, the chat section here and I'm going to put you in, right, in the discussion. So that's how it's going to work. When the first round is over, we're going to move on to the second round. So it's going to be the second debater to pose the question. And the same thing until Wilson Mendoza poses the last question. That's going to be the last turn. And Joe answers. And then we're going to have this uh, last turn. After the questions by the uh, all of you, the debaters, we, uh, I'm going to read some questions to the target from the public on YouTube. So if you are watching us on YouTube, you can write in the chat your question. Uh, we have some people there who are, who are going to gather all these questions and they're going to get it to me. And I'm going to read these questions here to Joe Levin. That's going to be at the end of, you know, uh, this, the first part of the debate. Uh, I think, is it clear to all of you? Is that all right? So uh, you want to say something, Wilson? You mute. You good? OK, so let's start. I'm going to pass the word to our special target today, Joseph Levin. Hi. Um, target's an interesting word for this. Uh, <laughs> uh, I feel like I should have a bullseye on my chest. Um, uh, at any rate, first of all, let me uh, just begin by uh, saying how honored I am and uh, to be the target of the first uh, brainstorms. Um, I, it really is a great honor and very humbling, and especially given this August panel. Um, and I want to also extend uh, a lot of thanks to specifically the people in Brazil who have organized this, Rodrigo, Marco, Gabriel behind the scenes. I don't know, Wilson, with how much you had to do with it, but given that you're the inspiration for it since, and I do remember the meeting you in Rio, that conference, that now, gosh, seven years ago, it's hard to keep track. Um, but anyway, it was a wonderful trip. And when, of course, I also have to say, I mean, in a way, it, um, it's wonderful that we can do this, but it is such a shame that we have to do this electronically. Um, this was obviously supposed to originally happen in uh, in some, it looked like absolutely gorgeous hideaway uh, out in uh, Brazil that I have to say my whole family was looking forward to that trip. But uh, if that were the worst thing that happened because of this virus, that would be okay. Um, but at any rate, Thank you all, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. And specifically, I haven't actually seen the, the three non-Brazilians here, Martina, Terry, and Charles for I don't know how long. Um, I can't remember when the last time I saw Martina was in free work, but, uh, but it's quite a while ago. Anyway, um, and, but they have been people that, you have been people I've known, I don't know, three decades, it's hard, it's hard to keep track now. But, but 
people who I have considered among my most important interlocutors about this question of consciousness over the decades. And so I was very happy when this was organized that all three of you agreed uh, to be part of it. And I look forward to the questions from the other two or three, depending on how many, uh, on what happens. But of course, I don't know you guys as well. Anyway, um, by way of opening statement, I guess I'll just say a little bit about uh, how I see the arc of, of uh, my thoughts on, on these issues and how I've developed over the past, it's getting to be close to 40 years now. Uh, no, I guess it is about 40 now. Um, so going back even further, I have to say, ever since I was a child, and I, this I think is common. I mean, all children are philosophers. It's They lose it when they get older, and philosophers are just people that never grew up. So um, uh, I always wondered, there's this difference between things that are have awareness, consciousness, some, you know, whatever. I don't know what I called it when I was young and other things like rocks and trees and houses. And, and, and it's very common, right? For a child to have the experience of asking, especially if they have a pet or something, boy, wouldn't it be great to know what it would be like to be my dog for a while or what it would be like to be my cat? to see the world through their eyes. And indeed, I mean, again, I don't know any child who's ever encountered animals who hasn't wondered that. And then I would ask myself, well, what would it be like to be a rock? And I would then realize, well, probably nothing. That, right, there is this cleavage in the world, it seems, between the things there's something it's like to be and the things there isn't. I didn't use those phrases. I'm obviously influenced now in the way I put it by Thomas Nagel, but it, it was clearly an issue for me. Um, having grown up very religious and believing in uh, dualistic metaphysics just came from the religion, um, it, it seemed clear that, okay, well, you know, there are souls and there are bodies and, and, and that explained it all. But once I became secular and an atheist, I no longer had that framework within which to think about this. And I, but I never lost this idea that there's something puzzling here. As an undergraduate in philosophy, it was interesting. I was mostly influenced by continental philosophy. I, I took a number of courses and in particular, I'll never forget one course on Sartre, where we basically plowed through, I think, all of being in nothingness or close to all of it, I can't remember. Um, and I was really grabbed. I thought, you know, Sartre had it right about consciousness. Um, and then I went to graduate school in the mid 70s and was immediately exposed to um, a lot of analytic, I knew some analytic philosophy as undergraduate, but, uh, but the mainstream of analytic philosophy, Quine and Goodman were still at Harvard where I went, but mostly I came under the, uh, I, I became influenced by Chomsky and Fodor over at MIT. And, uh, and ever since then, I have basically, you know, uh, accepted a lot of the kind of cognitive framework cognitive science framework, language of thought framework that um, uh, I studied and, and, and uh, learned about from Jerry Fodor, um, who was been a life, had been a lifelong um, mentor and friend, and also, of course, very influenced by Chomsky. Um, so here was this model of the mind that was completely naturalistic. We had functionalism had just come into vogue and we had the idea of realization and the idea that you've got this autonomous level of description at the computational level. And then there are, of course, issues about intentionality there. And then um, it's all realized in the brain. And all of that made sense, except I didn't see where consciousness fit in, or at least not consciousness as phenomenal or subjective consciousness. So, um, and that's when I, I it, part of my dissertation, uh, out of my dissertation came the, um, uh, came the uh, 
uh, exp explanatory gap paper that was mentioned. Um, and uh, I feel like over the last, uh, all the decades since then, I've almost been a little schizophrenic in a certain way uh, in that I completely am on board with the, I'll just call it the cognitive science framework. And yet on the other hand, consciousness, which seems like, you know, as, as Charles put it in his book, is very significant, uh, uh, seems completely left out. So I would, and I, and I did write papers that were specifically involved in just some of the debates, the naturalization debate and intentionality. I had papers on functional role versus uh, other kinds of, of, of topics, uh, of other moves in, uh, in the naturalization of intentionality. And when I was doing that, I was just sort of wholly in there. And then when I would turn to consciousness, I'd say, this just doesn't seem to touch the issue or the problem. So where have I come to now? Well, you know what? Not all that different. I still feel <laughs> of two minds, except that now that I'm near retirement, I'm thinking maybe I'll never actually solve this problem. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll end my career with a split brain as it were. Um, and, uh, However, I've tried to integrate the two, um, and we may get into that. I don't want to talk about sort of what the, uh, any particular aspects of the positions I'm working on now too much because, um, as I say, I think we'll get into it in more detail in the questions and answers. But I do want to say one other thing that's been a theme since, I guess, the 90s with me, and that is a, a way in which I have... Uh, been in a certain kind of conversation with others who share my, who you, we used to be called qualia freaks. Now I think they're nicer terms for us, maybe targets. I don't know. Um, and, uh, uh, but um, one very important strain in pushing the, the claims of qualia and phenomenal consciousness against materialism and naturalism where naturalism for the moment I'm understanding is the same as materialism, has been the some version of the conceivability argument. That has been a constant thing. I mean, you see it in Descartes, you see it everywhere. And I started out trying to build the notion of the explanatory gap out of the conceivability argument. And I took a rather, um, I think different line for most people. For most people, either look, you you saw the conceivability argument by being a type B materialist, as what Chalmers calls that is, you just appeal to um, the sort of Kripkean view about the relation between the metaphysics and epistemology of these things, um, or you see the conceivability argument as actually establishing in a in a kind of a priori manner, establishing dualism, proving that there have to be non-physical or non-physically -real, non realizable properties. And of course, for most of this time, I have had the view, again, this sort of schizophrenic view or sitting on the fence view, however you want to call it, that no, materialism is safe from the conceivability argument. And this is where a lot of my debate with Dave Chalmers has gone on. It, however, there's still an explanatory problem, and I thought of it as a purely epistemic issue. And the idea was supposed to be, look, it should be troubling to a materialist, even if, even if there are good reasons to think that materialism is true, it should still be troubling why we have so much trouble accepting it, why there's the intuitive resistance to it, why, um, why frankly, it doesn't feel like we can see how it could be true, even if it is true. And that is one way I, I certainly used to put it. Then more recently, in the past 10 years or so, I, I've decided, well, look, even though I'm, I still have my criticisms of certain standard versions of the conceivability argument, nevertheless, it seems to me there's another route to anti-materialism or dualism, and that is um, thinking of it as an inference of the best explanation. That is, given there's this epistemic puzzle, 
one explanation for it would be it's is that well it's because there is this actual metaphysical gap and that's why we can't um, explain the mental in terms of the physical because in fact in some sense the mental and here i mean by the mental the conscious uh stuff not the uh cognitive sciencey kind of stuff um that that is um uh uh that the fact that we can't get ourselves to understand or make intelligible how consciousness could be reducible to that um, computational stuff or functional stuff is actually best explained by the idea that it has a certain kind of primitive or basic status in nature and so i have sort of come around to that view where i am now is i'm uncomfortable about dualism as a term and partly because the more that i've seen all these debates over the years about how metaphysical necessity interacts with the a priori and the and, and the notions of explanation and the like more and more i feel like um the metaphysical framework within which we have discussed this is somehow inadequate to the kind of position that would really make the relation between um our the functional computational structure of the brain and consciousness understandable but the problem is even though i feel like it's a straitjacket of a kind that i would like to break out of i don't yet know how to do that so it um i don't really have a better way of formulating the metaphysical issues but um just to throw this out as a a showstopper somehow maybe spinoza's right that's what i've been thinking but anyway i'm going to end there thank you all right thank you very much Joe. uh so now we're gonna move on to the first turn of the debate so we're gonna have the question by professor charles seward you can un unmute yourself charles yeah I think, please uh, can you hear me all right yeah yeah so all right so so i'm on now okay here i go so uh first of all um i want to thank the uh organizers for inviting me to this it, it is an honor to to honor joe and to to target him um <laughs> uh and uh, i you know it's nice to meet or sort of meet uh, my brazilian uh, uh colleagues uh, marco and rodrigo and, and wilson so um, hopefully someday we could actually meet. And in fact, um, I hope someday we could talk about these things together because I, I feel like in, in, in thinking the last few days about Joe's work uh, and trying to think about what I might want to emphasize or, or bother him about, uh, I just there's just so much and it's complicated and it's the sort of thing that I feel like I can uh, do with confidence only if I have time to kind of hang out with somebody and talk to them and keep coming back. So that's all by way of partial excuse for the potential incoherence of my initial question. Um, now, uh, Marco told me that um, that I had 10 minute limit, which seems like a long time to ask a question, uh, but it makes me think I've got some time here to try to set things up and, and maybe, you know, bring up a number of things that are related um, that puts a lot of burden on Joe, I suppose, because he's got to keep track of all this uh, semi-digested stuff I, I throw at him, but hopefully uh, it'll be clear. So here's what I thought I would focus on. Um, it, it's not so much the, the metaphysical part that Joe was emphasizing in his uh, little um, tour of his intellectual development. Um, but it does relate to a, a certain theme in what he talked about, which was the way he he's kind of torn um, between his his Fedorian side, I guess, and maybe even his his Sartrean side. That is, uh, he 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 still is uh, has an allegiance to a computational theory of mind, and then at the same time he just feels like consciousness is something special, but that really doesn't handle. It's got some kind of interest of its own, and. It sounds to me like he's been struggling his whole life with how to integrate those and maybe now it's just kind of thinking well maybe integration is really not feasible but hey spinoza or something anyway <laughs> um 
so I wanted to to pick up on something. I've been trying to study the uh, article, the, some of the more recent work, and I was looking at the acquaintance is consciousness piece, and and trying to the, the really interesting paper, and just but then it got very complicated too. So let me just try to throw out some things, um, and maybe it, even if the question isn't as focused as it might be, the it will give you something to talk about, and the other something to pick up on. So I gather the picture is this that. Um, there's there's this notion of acquaintance in 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 philosophical in the philosophical tradition and it looks like there's maybe three roles that it could play in a philosophical theory uh one a um a um, semantic role uh, uh, that is going to uh, give us some kind of basic connection between maybe our atomic expressions or our singular terms and their reference um and then that harks back, I guess, to Russell. Another is a kind of a justificatory role. It's going to pr do the work of, of uh, providing some kind of justification beyond the kind of, for beliefs, beyond what other beliefs can provide. Um, and then there's this kind of objectual knowledge role. There's this, the, the, it, where uh, what the coins might do for us is it gives us a kind of knowledge of which object is in question. And the big picture I got is that for Joe, consciousness is acquaintance. And the question about whether, uh, then the question becomes whether uh, the kind of acquaintance that consciousness is fills all of those roles. And his answer is that it does the which knowledge, sorry, the which object knowledge role, the, the objectual knowledge role, but not the, um, the semantic role or the justificatory role. And where I was resisting this is it seems um, it was seeming to me that at least when I start to think about it in terms of a particular kind of example, it looks like the, all the roles fall or stand together. So there's my challenge, I guess, to, to Joe, but um, I won't be able to, to develop it. But let, let me just start before I run out of my 10 minutes. I start on this by kind of presenting an example of what I take to be a, a kind of ordinary consciousness that um, would uh, plausibly fill the objectual knowledge role. And then I wonder uh, why wouldn't it also do the other two things? So it, here's what I was thinking of. So um, uh, I might refer to the shape of my US congressional district, right? It has a, a certain shape on the map, a really peculiar shape because it's one of the most grotesquely gerrymandered districts in the entire U.S. and there are a lot of those, but I think it might be on the top. And um, uh, I could refer to that shape, but do I know which shape that shape is? Well, there's a sense I want to say, and I, I take it this is kind of in line with what Joe is suggesting. There's a sense in which I don't know which shape the shape of my condition, congressional district is until I've looked at a map and uh, the shape of the image of it on the map has become visually apparent to me. And that visual appearance of the shape is a kind of visual acquaintance uh, with the shape. Uh, and uh, it's that that supplies some kind of missing uh, knowledge of which shape that shape is that I wouldn't have without the perceptual experience, without the perceptual consciousness of the shape. Uh, that all seems right to me because it also seems right to me that if I try to conceive of a kind of uh, perception, an unconscious perception, maybe some kind of blindsight perception, it wouldn't do the same job of informing me of which shape of that shape is. Right. So I, I, you, you, somebody says to me, you know, the shape of your con congressional district, Charles, I like. Well, I, I understand the expression, and I guess there is a referent of that, but I don't know which shape that is. And then they say, well, go look online and look at that map, that crazy shape. And I do. Um, I think that if I had only kind of a blindside, unconscious visual perception, I wouldn't have, um, I wouldn't have filled the same, uh, the same uh, gap in, in which object or which shape knowledge that gets filled by the experience. I, I don't know if... That's one thing I'm asking is whether I'm thinking along these kinds of things along the same lines as Joe, because this seems to me a compelling example of the kind of way consciousness can do this job of uh, giving us this which which knowledge. Um, but 
But if that's right, I, I, I have a lot of questions too about Joe's reasons for thinking that if you take, if you leave consciousness aside and just try to work with a computational theory of mind, you don't have anything that's going to fill, at least in the same way or to the same degree, the kind of gap that is filled by a visual consciousness. Um, uh, because I don't think he does it in terms of the ways I just suggested with this kind of blindside thought experiment. It's sort of more principled. There's something about the nature of the causal co uh, variational connection between the the brain and the object represented that kind of keeps it from doing the full which object um, job. But I, I, so part of what I want to learn more from Joe is about what you know whether I'm on the right. He accepts the kind of example. If he does, then it seems to me hard for me to understand why it also isn't pretty importantly implicated in semantic and justificatory roles. So let me see if I can say this. Um, so let's grant me my first point that I know which shape that shape is from my example, only by a perceptual consciousness of it. But uh, if Joe is right, and that's not necessary for the semantic role, then it seems like maybe I should be able to understand what an utterance of that shape refers to just by instancing a kind of uh, uh, brain representation that causally co, co varies with the state. Um, but I guess I want to say if I if I if I can't know what shape this shape is, but by visual or other perceptual consciousness of it then uh, how could I understand which shape the phrase this shapes refers to without perceptual consciousness? It seems like those two things kind of stand or fall together. Uh, now, maybe he wants to say, well, you can, you can at least mean a particular shape by that shape without the perceptual consciousness of the shape, but you can't understand what you mean by that shape. But then that seems like a pretty robust semantic role already that's being played, and that seems important. And then as for the, the justificatory role, I, I was thinking about an example like this using my, my case. Suppose, I, you know, you also have a, a, a heavily gerrymandered uh, congressional district, and we're looking at the two uh, images of them on our maps. And um, I, I say that shape pointing at my district map differs from that shape pointing at the other district map. Now, um, I think I'm, I'm justified in believing that that shape differs from this shape. Um, I want to say yes, in line with the uh, sort of story he's uh, suggested that it's because that, uh, that looks a different shape to me, looks a different shape to me than this other shape. Um, but if that looking, that visual appearance, that visual acquaintance, if you like, plays no justificatory role that couldn't be played in its absence, um, and I'm also right that I don't understand what shape I mean by that shape in either case, then I have the funny result that I'm justified in believing that that shape is different from that shape with respect to shape, even though I don't understand what either shape is. <laughs> I don't understand what shape I'm referring to when I, with, you know, with, with the two tokens of that shape. Now, maybe that was a convoluted first question to ask, but I guess what I wanted to do is set up the whole issue of acquaintance that I know has come to dominate Joe's thinking about consciousness a lot and, and it's kind of made him more interesting, complicated his tug of war in himself between the Fodor side and the Sautra side. But um, uh, I guess I'm, the challenge is that to, to convince me that these roles really come apart. I mean, it seems like if you, once you grant the, the consciousness, the 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 job of uh, providing this this which object knowledge, um, it's going to do something important for us semantically and uh, epistemically. Okay, that's my that's my <laughs> my question. Oh, thank you very much, Charles. So, Joe, uh, my, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh well, thank you for that. Um, uh, so, first of all, um, 
in that paper, when I talked about objectual knowledge, I wasn't actually concerned with the which object issue. Oh. Um, I was. Uh, uh, it's still it's not it's still not quite a never mind uh, issue, but um, <laughs> but we, we haven't gotten to that yet. But but it wasn't it wasn't the issue. I mean, I know like Campbell is very um, concerned about that and, and and about using consciousness to identify what you're referring to and stuff. That actually isn't what I had in mind. I was mostly um, when I was thinking about objectual knowledge, and in particular, it didn't really have to be objects. I mean, it could be properties too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I was thinking about actually um, a certain kind of response to the Mary problem that people like Michael Ty and others have pushed, where they're trying to trying to say that um, what what Mary. I'm uh, so he, he, I, I Michael Ty does change his position a lot, and I'm tr don't think this is exactly the way he would put it now, but there certainly was a stage. At the time I was writing the paper, um, I know he had this kind of view that what I think it was in Rio. He gave a paper about this, actually. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. You're okay, right. So um, that's what I thought. Uh, uh, the scene is coming back to me that um, he was trying to say, look, we, we all want to find some way we materialists want to find some way to say in what sense Mary learned something new when she leaves the room. Um, and of course there are all different kinds of ways materialists have done this, but he was thinking, well, look, here's the difference. It's a, it's objectual knowledge. She had propositional knowledge about the qualitative character beforehand, but now she has objectual knowledge, right? And at the time I was thinking objectual knowledge, what, and, and he kept using, and, and, and again, other people talk about this, use this, um, uh, examples like knowing a person, knowing a city, you know, all those sorts of notions where the grammar, right, is that, you know, no takes a direct object rather than a propositional object, rather than a that clause, right? And, you know, how much you want to emphasize the difference in grammatical structure between these cases is, is revealing a real difference in, in actual epistemic, uh, the substance of the epistemic relation. Okay, I, I'm not as into using the uh, grammar as other people are, but nevertheless, it was, it was suggestive. And what occurred to me, and I'm not sure this is a, in the end, whether this is a, um, how good an argument this is, but what occurred to me was that in some sense he was right, that is, in some sense, there, that may be a good way to capture what happens to Mary. She knows red or red qualitative character. Leave aside whether it's the red of the world. She knows reddishness, as I might say. Um, whereas before, she knew about reddishness. That is, before, she had lots of propositions that may have referred to this um, feature of people's mental life but she didn't know it directly. And I was trying to think, is there anything in, as it were, the computational model that makes sense out of that? And in the end, I thought, no, there isn't. Actually, a computational model, I thought, and I still think, um, I mean, I, was ch I remember I've been challenged on this uh, in places, um, but it seems to me that insofar as knowledge is a propositional attitude, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to enter debates about whether knowledge is primitive or it's belief plus other things, I think it includes at least a, at its core a belief-like state, which is a relation to, a, to a, a, a representation that expresses a proposition. And it struck me that um, you needed propositional structure in your in what it is you're cognizing in order to call it any kind of real cognizing. There's, in fact, it struck me that what the perceptual system and the cognitive system can do with respect to objects is represent them. That is, there will be, if you have um, uh, uh, a state that has a propositional structure, 
and it and in particular and if in, if it has a singular term that's picking out an individual or even a a, a predicate that's picking out a particular property that it can represent that but it can't know it knowing it or having some kind of genuine cognition of it is something that only comes when you put that representation into the context of something that has a proposition is truth of valuable um, and and then it becomes knowledge if it meets whatever other conditions such states have to meet. But it struck me in the conscious, in acquaintance, that's precisely what we have. We have a kind of cognizing, as it were, grabbing, taking in, you know, I mean, it's all metaphors. I'm sorry about that. But we have something like that that is just a relation between a subject and an object which is very different from internally representing a fact like thing out in the world. And um, I thought, okay, so actually the objectual knowledge thing is right, except it's not gonna save the computational model because there really isn't anything like that that's reconstructable on the computational model. So that, that was what I had in mind. I wasn't actually thinking about the question of which object so much, just the idea of a subject standing in a, in a kind of cognizing relation to an object. So that said, um, you, your question still holds, which is why don't I think that, that uh, so that's, what, that's the role I thought that the non-naturalistic acquaintance plays. Okay, for okay. the uh, for the other two roles, which were semantic primitive and um, um, epistemic primitive, basically, um, it seemed to me, first of all, that that actually was pretty naturalizable, uh, with the caveat that some kind of naturalistic theory of intentionality works out. <laughs> You know, I, there's always in the background this problem that, you know, people worked on this for 20 years or so or 30 years. And then, you know, it, it seems to me that a lot of people have, to a certain extent, given up um, trying to, you know, there was this period where Fodor, Dretzky, Milliken, everybody was just going at it, right? And it petered out, certainly no consensus as to what actually establishes the representational link between a symbolic token in the brain and anything out there in the world. But to the extent, I mean, and if that in the end doesn't have an answer, then, you know, that that's, that undermines a whole lot of that framework. But with the assumption that I was working with, that that question has an answer, whether it's Fodor's asymmetric dependence or it's Millikan's teleosemantics, whatever it is, that if it has an answer, then it struck me that um, yes, we can we we get where we can see how we can have semantic primitives that aren't themselves uh, that is uh, representational primitives that have atomic uh, that are like atomic concepts, and then we have how we have compositionality handle all the rest. Uh, so that's where the the burden of the semantic relation to the world is. And I'm all, and I'm also, uh, I mean, I actually wrote a paper on this about demonstratives. I was part of the work that was partly intended to uh, uh, address issues in cognitive science that, yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of reason for thinking that indexicals and demonstratives might be an essential part of the representational framework that is what it gets us hooked onto the world. Okay. But so that's how we get, that's how the naturalistic view handles that. As far as the um, epistemic primitives, well, I guess I, I was thinking that um, nothing in the end justification ha has to um, depend upon the actual cognitive processing that takes us from the uh, initial uh, perceptual encounter that is just the stimuli hitting the, the nerve endings and ends in belief. And, you know, like many people, um, 
I think that, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to be a foundationalist. Uh, there's lots of reasons for thinking that there, there needn't be some um, um, absolutely um, epistemic primitive on which all justification ends. There are, there are all kinds of theoretical considerations and stuff. So that the idea of using acquaintance is the ultimate basis uh, for epistemic justification wasn't going to be um, necessary because it, it, it had a certain kind of foundationalist assumption that I wasn't um, going to buy into. Now, the reason I think that the n n sort of call it non-natural acquaintance doesn't do those things is that I see it as, and, and this is the part that I still can't, in my own view, I can't get my head around my own view here, but nevertheless, um, I see the um, conscious experience as an outgrowth of the cognitive phenomena, not as an input to it. And therefore, it doesn't seem to me, it seems to me we need a theory of the intentionality of computational primitives and a theory of justification for the computational system that is independent of consciousness. Now, your question about the shapes, of course, they have to be represented somewhere in the perceptual uh, area. It's very possible that there's something like a map-like, picture-like, non-conceptual kind of representation, and that we have ways of internally demonstrating that from cognition. But it seems to me all of that is perfectly adequate to handle those issues without getting into the empirical details about exactly how that happens. I mean, there could be empirical problems that I'm not aware of, but, um, but nevertheless, uh, in principle, it seems reconstructable on those. And um, so therefore I'm not, um, I don't see the role for the non, for the experience to play because I see experience, uh, this gets back to the Spinoza remark as more a kind of reflection of what the cognitive, uh, well, as I put it in a couple of papers, as a theater that's created by the cognitive system, where the cognitive system writes the script. Uh, it's hor horribly metaphorical, and I'm sure people are gonna push me on that. But insofar as that's the case, all the justificatory and semantic work has been done in some sense by the time you get to experience. Anyway, that's that's how I was thinking about it. Yeah, can I can I do a follow up or how does? Yeah, you can you can react first, and then I go to the follow ups. Okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Quick reaction. Well, first of all, I, I just so that I can not seem like I <laughs> made a whole bunch of stuff up and and attributed it to you. I think what I was picking up on for the which object stuff is you you in the you refer to Russell's principle that in order to think about anything we have to know which object we're talking about and so I thought okay that's the way to understand what objectual knowledge is but I think I, I I picked that up and went to town with it but that maybe was kind of a side comment and 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 sent me I, sent think me I have to go back to the paper yeah <laughs> which a, may, a number of papers I reread, by the way, before this, but I forgot to reread re <laughs> this one. But I think I actually mentioned that in order to set it aside. And so, uh, okay. Well, I think uh, so, but I'll, I'll reread it and maybe. Yes, yeah, we have to look at the text. First about it. Okay, so that's where where I got that. Um, and I think that maybe a lot of what's dividing us may be kind of too big t to cover in a quick back and forth right now. The pictures are too different, or something. The background pictures. But um, well, let me ask you this, because in connection with your your little um, dialogue uh, with Michael Tai over his response to the knowledge argument, do you think here's what seems weird to me about Michael Tai's responses you uh, represented uh, that um, it's it, so what what Mary uh, comes to know is she she now knows red, and that just seems to me like that's a really weird way of putting what, uh, I mean, what I felt like it'd be natural to say is that she comes to know how red looks to her and probably by inference other people. And then you can talk about, you know, w w whether that causes problems for physicalism or not. But 
that she comes to know red do you know red i mean that i doesn't even seem to me like a, a a nice place to start it doesn't even make sense in idiomatic english i think unless red is the name of a person or something but it, it, in any case the the um uh, the second and kind of an aspect of the weirdness of that as a starting place for me is also that I don't think that just something's looking red to me is a piece of knowledge of, of that's it's not of, of any sort. And I mean, maybe I don't, I don't understand what the phrase knowledge by acquaintance means. I mean, here's an ambiguity, maybe, and I, I want to know how you come down on it. You might think, uh, well, knowledge by acquaintance is a kind of acquaintance that just is knowledge, right? Uh, or B, it's uh, uh, acquaintance as a means for getting that kind of knowledge. And uh, so the, the second seems to fit my little story about understanding um, which shape is meant by that shape, right? The, the appearance of the shape is the means by which I understand what shape is picked out by the phrase. Um, and, and But maybe you and Michael Tyre are both operating with the assumption that visual appearances themselves are knowings right um and that you know i i'm i've resisted the um sellers business in the, uh, about the myth of the given uh his story all uh as soon as i read it but one thing i thought was was right was that that merely uh, having a visual consciousness of a color isn't knowing anything um, but maybe I'm already now on a different side from, you know, weirdly enough, you and Michael Tyre together or something, and, and I'm on the outside of this. Is that how you were thinking of it? And Well, yeah. So, look, I mean, part of the problem is that, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, knowledge is a, is a very hefty notion. <laughs> There's a lot built into it. Um, let me, and that's why I, I was trying to play a Chomsky here and call it cognize, just so that I had a word that didn't have to have all of the implications of the word knowledge um, uh, in it. Um, I guess what I had in mind is the following kind of contrast. Um, and that is, if we think of, um, so within the naturalistic framework, if we think of the most primitive relation that holds between um, uh, 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 symbols in the head and the world. I think it, it's the representation relation. But I, th I think of the representation relation as it arises within the context of uh, the computational model as something that the mind doesn't do. It's something that happens to it as it were. I don't decide to refer to something. I don't mentally, reference in this sense isn't an act that I do. It's something that by tokening a symbol, I, ought, I stand in the right relation and it, as it were, happens. The world, by putting this device into the world, there are these things that it immediately grabs onto, but that isn't as it were an activity of the mind. It isn't a kind of mental state. Representation is something that is enables mental states, but isn't itself, as it were, a mental state. Um, and what gets you in the mental state is when you adopt an attitude toward a proposition, believing it, not believing it, desiring it, hoping it's true, then you're in the business of now of having a mental relation to this situation. But acquaintance with something seemed uh, much more uh, of a mental kind of act than mere representing something. Okay. Right. So what I was trying in my in my critique of the move of the tie type move to make a distinction between, and I was using the word no because of course that's how he's talking about it, objectual knowledge. Is it real full-blooded knowledge? Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard for me to know, but it strikes me that when you're conscious of a quality, right, 
the quality has become has been taken in by you in some way and and that's why i was using you know words like cognized or stuff whereas when you're merely representing a quality it's as it were outside the the realm of the mental in a certain way right it's it's something that is a precondition for everything else being mental but itself is not part of a mental relation um and what i was trying to say is that the primitive role that representation plays and what it does in the naturalistic framework can't capture this notion that we feel like Mary finally is acquainted with this quality. All right. There's something happening with acquaintance here that you don't get with merely now she's able to represent it. Remember, a lot of the literature that was trying to rep trying to respond to the Mary problem originally on the materialist side was to try to show that there was some way she was missing some representational capacity in some way. And this was a move by, and, and, and I'm trying to say, no, actually, yeah, I think the people who say there are lots of ways to represent things and there isn't any privileged way to represent them and there's, you know, uh, maybe right, but there is this other thing of really being acquainted, really knowing the thing, but I agree, knowing is a, is a funny word there. Um, but I just meant something that, uh, clearly different from merely representing okay so I don't know if that helps yeah yeah no i i think here's the takeaway for me is that you think that there's a sense in which being visually conscious of a color say counts as a kind of cognizing of it and that that you know partly on intuitive grounds i just you know so that that that, that seems to be in the cognizing and not just something that happens to me sort of uh, category, and that this computational theory of mind sort of doesn't have any place for that category of cognizance. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So we have a follow up by Terry Horgan. Oh, you're Joe, mute. Oh, I need. I am I unmuted now? Yeah. No, you're good now. You can go. Okay. Uh, concerning the Mary problem and the way that acquaintance might figure in, in a way that yields knowledge, a new kind of knowledge, full blown knowledge. I just wanted to put out a thought about that, which is a way I've tended to think about it and, and see what you think, Joe. I mean, I've always wanted to say that, yes, she does learn something new it is a new item of knowledge, so it's propositional. Now, how would she put it in language? What would be the best public language articulation of it? Well, it's always seemed to me that about the best that could be done that way would be to use indexicals. And I like to put it this way. This, small, small case of this, is this, large scale, uh, caps, Capital, capital this, or maybe small case, this is like this, capital. And so the first use of this small case is playing a singular reference role. So it's referring to the particular um, a phenomenal state of mind that I'm in now, the token of it. The other one, the capital this, is playing a predicated role. They're both indexical, okay? The, the indexical predicative role is um, basically using the token to um, pick out the type of which it is a token. This is like this. Now, it, why is it essentially new knowledge, knowledge that she couldn't have had before she had the relevant kind of experience? Well, this is where the acquaintance idea comes in. Um, you're acquainted with the phenomenal character by, by being in the phenomenal state. And, okay, so, so far we're not talking knowledge. Um, we're talking about um, a kind of direct relation um, of the kind that, Joe, you say you like and you think is something right that Michael Tai was onto. 
so far so good. But my thought was that this very uh, acquaintance connection that you now have um, can play a certain sort of internal semantic role, which I like to formulate as self-presenting mode of presentation. And so now you can um, construct representations. I mean, this is maybe a way of thinking of representation as being more mental than the way, Joe, you said you tend to think about it. But at least this kind of representation can be constructed. It's got an indexical aspect, but what you're indexically picking out is being picked out via a pertinent mode of presentation of the item referred to. And the mode of presentation is the experience itself. Um, it's pheno the phenomenal character itself can play this distinctive self-presenting mode of presentation role. And indeed it can play it both in a singular indexical uh, capacity so that the small case of this is in a singular indexical picking out of the token phenomenal state. And it can also play it in a predicative indexical role where uh, the capital this is picking out the type of which the state is a, to is a token via the self-presentational character of the token itself. So now what she gets is a full-blown piece of knowledge. It is expressible linguistically, although nobody would understand it who didn't know what the small case of this and the this case and the capital of this are picking out, didn't know them via the relevant um, mode of presentation. And if you're in Mary's situation before she leaves the room, she doesn't have that kind of mode of presentation. So she can't form those kinds of essentially indexical uh, representational components, singular and predicative. And so she can't have the relevant knowledge that uh, consists of the, of the putting them together into the propositional content this is like this. So what, what do you think of that way of doing things? I'm unmuted, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I guess, uh, well, first of all, I don't deny that knowledge uh, can be built up uh, <laughs> once you, you have the acquaintance. I mean, that Mary can actually um, say uh, that she knows something now and form a proposition that maybe she couldn't form before. I, I wasn't denying that. Um, I mean, once she has this objectual cog cognizing, let me call it that, you know, then, then lots of other things may follow. My main problem with the kind of a with the kind of approach um, you're uh, talking about and why I don't think indexicals can do the job is, well, first of all, there's there's always this problem with, in, uh, with demonstratives. I think a genuine demonstrative has, you have to know what you're picking out. That is, I don't think a demonstrative can be, and I, this is probably not what you were saying, but often it has been certainly certain views that are in the vicinity of what you were expressing have talked about demonstrative concepts as concepts that are as actually built up out of a demonstrative. And that actually was one of the notions I was attacking in that demonstrative thought paper saying no demonstration, which I do think of as a mental act, is something that already requires that you have represented in some way what it is you're demonstrating. And, and then another problem I have about the using the token as a way of, uh, as the demonstratum, so that you're saying the type of which this is a token, is that um, I think there's a problem about ambiguity, which is why you have to already know, I think, which type you're talking about. It can't be, as it were, that the demonstration can't give that to you. But of course, you weren't, you weren't, um, subject to those kinds of objections because you talked about self-presenting modes of presentation. But that's, to me, where all the action is. Uh, 
what I want to argue is I don't understand how a naturalist can even describe what a self-presenting mode of presentation is. In fact, the kind of acquaintance and objectual knowledge that I'm talking about would actually come in right at the stage of saying what self-presentation is, what it is to be presented with something. Um, that to me is where the acquaintance enters. Um, so um, I think insofar as I interpret self-presentation as what I'm thinking of as acquaintance, then the fact that then I can build propositions out of uh, demonstratives that involve that, that, are, that actually doesn't bother me. But as a, as a way, as many materialists, as you know, do, I mean, um, uh, I'm thinking of, um, well, I know Ned Block has a paper like that, and, and um, Papineau, used, I don't know if he still has the view, but certainly had the view. I mean, this idea that you're using the phenomenal token to represent and either demonstratively or by itself or something, and that that's what uh, captures this, this idea of self-presentation. I don't think it can do that. I think self-presentation itself, there's no place for it in a, in a causal functional account of the mind. So that's, uh, so in a way, yes, if by self-presentation, you mean something like what I mean by acquaintance, then I'm fine. But then that's what I'm talking about. That's what Mary gets. Um, because now she's having an experience. Experiences are self-presenting, yes. Other kinds of states I'm in are not. What makes the kind of state that's self-presenting what it is, that's, that's the puzzle of consciousness to me. Yeah, Terry? Oh. You're muted. Oh. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, now you are. I I didn't necessarily mean to suggest what I was saying as something that would help the naturalist. Um, well, then <laughs> that's a further question entirely. Yeah, yeah, no, but then, but then I, I think self-presentation actually is what I'm trying to get at. Okay, good, good. All right, so uh, I think we're going to move on to the next turn, and uh, Martin Niederhummelin is going to ask her a question. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, you can go. Okay, great. So I would like to, to raise a totally different issue. You just said that the problem about consciousness is the problem about self-representation. And as you may perhaps remember, I disagree. I think the problem about consciousness is the problem of about the existence of experiencing subjects mainly that is about those for whom it is like something to undergo experiences and i remember the discussion that we had in fribourg about this and and um you then had the view if i remember correctly that um there is no well, you, I think you put it, there is no self. There are no selves. And that there are, that the problem, it's an illusion to think that there are. Now, I don't want to argue for the existence of selves because I find that notion very confusing and inadequate. But I would like to press you a little bit on how one can even understand consciousness without explicitly thinking of those for whom it's like something to have experiences. And a very simple way to get to this is to use this locution that you yourself use so much, um, the what it's like on leaving out what it's like was the title of your important paper uh, many years ago. And so my very simple point is that this is talking in an elliptical manner. In what? We want to, in an elliptical manner. And this is to express an incomplete thought, so to speak, or to leave implicit in the 
verbal expression, something that you have to think of in order to understand it. So if, for instance, we say that it's like something um, to undergo an experience or to have a certain property like seeing blue, um, then implicitly we have to think this. It's like something for someone to undergo it. And without this uh, additional element, we, we really don't know what we are, uh, what we are having in mind. We, are, we have no clear idea. So it seems to me totally unavoidable to introduce the experiencing subject, the one for whom it is like something to have experiences. So this is the main point, but perhaps I can um, add a few things that are related to this. Um, when you presented the explanatory gap in your earlier writings, um, you were talking about something that I, one could call the contrast explanatory gap. You said that um, given um, complete knowledge about the physical process that underlies green experiences, we won't understand why they underlie green experiences as opposed to red experiences. Now, I wonder if you would agree with me that this is not the most important, the most fundamental um, issue here in with respect to the explanatory gap to understanding, to making intelli intelligible that consciousness arises. It's precisely that there is consciousness at all based on certain things going on in physical systems. What's really so amazing and astonishing um, is that certain physical systems give rise to consciousness at all. And now I wonder how can we express what we are wondering about there? And it seems to me the most natural expression is to say, well, it's astonishing that brains like yours give rise to there being someone Joe, for whom it's like something to live through his life. That's really the astonishing issue. And I would like to call this the fundamental explanatory gap. And I wonder, I, well, I already wonder how you think about this, but perhaps a further more concrete question in, in, in relation. If you don't have the experiencing subject in the picture, then you will have to find another another way to express this fundamental explanatory gap. And then perhaps you could say, well, well the fundamental explanatory gap is uh, concerned with there being events that have qualia at all, that um, events occur with qualitative character. But then I would come back to the point that I made at the beginning and wonder, what does that mean, that events have qualia? And among other things, it means that they have properties that determine what it's like to undergo the event, the experience. And then in order to understand that again, I would say they determine what it's like for the subject concerned to undergo this event. And so again, the subject comes in. And I wonder how you would like to avoid this, or do you want to avoid it? That's my question. So as usual, I'm going to try to split the difference. Uh, um, I certainly agree with you. And, and I myself, uh, in a lot of literature, not, not so much in the early papers, I agree with you, though even there, Absent qualia was always an issue too, right? So, uh, so an absent qualia is just the idea that there's nothing it's like to be this. Why is there? And in fact, as I said, what used to get me as a kid is, why is there something it's like to be me? I'm assuming there's something it's like to be my dog, but there's nothing it's like to be this rock, right? And ha what, what's going on there? And I, I, I think I agree with you and didn't mean to say anything. Um, that would uh, 
uh, directly contradict the claim that this means there has to be a subject of the experience. Uh, uh, um, I don't want to deny that. I'm trying to remember <laughs> this conversation from 10 or so years ago. I, I do remember. I mean, I do remember there being a, 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 a thing. So I. So there's a couple of things that I think at the time I had in mind and might not have actually been what targeting what you were actually saying. So maybe there was some misunderstanding. So the first thing I just want to say is um, I thought, and I think in other work you have, I thought you were pressing the idea that having a kind of substantial self, uh, in fact, substance dualism of a certain kind would actually solve the problem of personal identity. Right. And that's what I meant by a self, a self that has certain kinds of in identity conditions across time. And I was trying to say, I don't actually think there is such a thing that can play that role. OK. And and of course, we may disagree about that, but that is a slight that is a somewhat different. And that's what I meant by saying a self. So that when I think about that child who was wondering about rocks, and I say that was me, right? I don't think there's the kind of metaphysical grounding for that claim of it's me that can do the role that much of our, and in this sense, I'm a bit of a Parfidian, okay? Um, and that that is, I think, what I was trying to get at at the time. But again, I don't remember enough of the conversation to know what else I may have said. Nevertheless, I do think that the structure of a conscious experience does have the sort of, I don't know, I guess you call it act object, whatever, but I do think there is a presentation and for there to be a presentation, there has to be a, a something to which there is presentation. However, I don't, there were two other things I want to say there. And I, I don't know again, whether this is in uh, con um, conflict with what you want to say. But two other things I want to say there is one, I don't think the self that is the, as it were, uh, as I like to think of it in, in my uh, notion of a Cartesian theater revival is uh, the sole audience member of my Cartesian theater. I don't think that self is itself part of the, as it were, part of the what's experienced. That is, I don't think you're experiencing yourself. I, yeah, you don't either. I, I thought so. there are obviously people who do. And th that's part of the whole issue about what self-consciousness is and the like. So, yes, there is a, a me that's or a subject that is, in fact, taking this in. But the this that I'm taking in doesn't include me. Right. And in that and that to that extent, I was sort of agreeing with Hume that if you look inside, you don't find the self as an object of your conscious experience and the like. And so it's more of a kind of Kantian transcendental ego, given what kind of uh, uh, what kind of thing conscious experience is. It's what it's like for. And then I don't like to emphasize the me. That's where the self thing comes in, is if there's some substantial notion of what who I am and what I am. I think that's not part of the conscious experience, but that it is a matter of being a subject to whom something is being presented, a subject acquainted with something, I don't want to deny. I do think that's there. And I think it's a, as it were, shadow element, as it were, in, in the context of the conscious experience. Then there's a further question, what, what kinds of identity conditions can be given for, for such an entity? And my view is the only identity conditions for objects that we can have are for concrete objects. And those are subject to all the, all the kinds of problems that we know from trying to say what it is to be the same chair over time or the same brain over time or the same, I mean, we just don't have, um, there aren't definitive um, answers to those. So so that's how I'm trying to, if you see what I mean by splitting the difference. Perhaps just briefly, two re reactions, if I may. Um, well, 
you said the the self is not it's not given to the experiencing subject as an object i totally agree but this doesn't mean i would like to say that it's not that we, we are not aware in a phenomenally manifest manner of ourselves there can yeah. be an, yeah and uh, so that's the the way i would go there yeah um, the I, other look, yeah i'm sorry can i respond to that point though yeah yeah uh, um here's another split the difference thing i mean one thing i've tried to do and, and i did it in that paper that's sort of quasi sartre in theory um was try to build the forness as it were not the for meanness the forness mm -hmm. into the relation as a um as actually a feature as i said instead of a constituent and part of the idea was there not to have a sort of secondary awareness view where there are, as it were, a primary target and a secondary target, mm -hmm. because that still involves making the self a target. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm trying to get rid of. But that it's somehow manifest in the awareness, there un undoubtedly there might be a formulation of that that I would accept. Okay. Um, on on the issue about trans temporal identity, just, just something very brief. I, I do think that if one takes seriously this, what it's like locution and introduces the for whom it's like something, then one also has the tools to, to, to explain why it's very difficult, at least intuitively, to have the same attitude towards identity of conscious beings as one has towards um, identity across time of table ships and so on and and the reason is that uh, when you, when you have identity between an earlier and a later existing conscious subject then for instance it for the earlier existing one it must be something to undergo those of the later one there must be one subject for whom it's like something to have the first experiences of, of the earlier one and also those of the later one and it looks like and I, I wonder if you would agree it looks like at first sight that any reductive analysis psychological continuity and what, whatever doesn't guarantee that there is one single subject for whom it's like something to have the earlier and the later experiences and I think that that's the problem to be taken very seriously and so yeah, yeah. I do. Um, I worry about it incessantly. That is, <laughs> you know, I've had various medical procedures I've had to go through in the last couple of years. And as they get close and I start getting nervous and uh, I have to get a, I'm nervous about my medical procedures <laughs> in a way that even if it's my loved ones, I'm not nervous about them. It's not the same thing. Right. And I think, um, who was it? I don't know. It was, when when personal identity was really being discussed a lot in the 60s and 70s and 80s it seems to me this whole idea of anticipation was right. crucial right i anticipate my future experience in a way i can't anticipate your future experience i can care a lot about your future experience but i can't anticipate it mm -hmm. right um or i can't anticipate having it that, that that's what mm -hmm. I mean. mm -hmm. and i do agree that that seems to bring with it a notion of identity right. and here's where I um, as I say I'm a bit of a Parfidian I think that the idea that there has to be a principled answer to whether I actually appropriately stand in the anticipation <laughs> relation or not given all of these you know splitting cases and all you know all the troublesome cases people have I don't believe that at least from the contents of the Cartesian theater as I experience or anything I know from natural science, there is anything that's going to give you a principled answer. So I'm inclined to think it's an illusion. Okay. It doesn't mean I don't care. Of course I care. No, no. Yeah. no but I, I find it funny that you take a quite different position here than you do in, in your explanatory gap. <laughs> um, in the ideas, because there you would say, how come, how come um, we have this 
remaining intuition that something is unexplained and then you had what you yeah. said today about the best explanation but i go the same way you go for the explanatory gap yeah. for identity right i guess i don't I, I, so here i mean here we're playing phenomenological intuition at, at, at a high level here that where where um I'm, if i had a table here oh here's a table i'll pound on it um uh um, I, the intuition that I, that I care a lot about my future, um, in a special, not care, but you know what I mean, in that special way, that I stand in that special kind of relation, um, doesn't seem to me as uh, contradicted by any actual experience I have in a way that um, any conscious experience contradicts the claim that the functionalist makes. Okay. And that's yeah. not, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. I stopped there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you both. And uh, now uh, Rodrigo just asked for a little break. It, it might be a smart thing to do. And uh, I think uh, we're going to have this two minutes break. Uh, I think this moderator himself is just going to go to the toilet and get back here in one, two minutes. And you all feel free to do that. I think it's time to unmute you all so you can chat a bit while we have this two minutes uh, break. And I think Ma Martine, she told me that she has to leave for personal reasons. Uh, you still have to, you have to leave now, right? I have to, uh, yeah, I'm very sorry, yeah. No, sorry. That, that... It was great seeing you, Martina. Yeah, it yeah. was great seeing you. <laughs> let's great. let's Thank do you this. Thank very much. <laughs> let's do this again, yeah. Yeah, in person. All right, yeah. so two minutes, you said? So I'm gonna... Yeah. Two minutes now. And I just want to say bye to Martina and to thank her again. Thank you very much for being here. And we get back in two minutes, right? Okay, great.
Ah. Now I am. Now I am. Okay. All right. Uh, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. I heard an echo oh, for a second, but now I'm on. I got this unplugged. That's a stupid. Okay. I see. Uh, All right. Now I can hear you. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Good. Uh, all right. So I'm going to take this time to make a few announcements. So the first one is to the people watching us on YouTube. If you are one of them, feel free to uh, post questions uh, in the chat in YouTube. I'm going to read these questions later. Uh, uh, I think, are we all back now? Because Martin left, right? So, yeah, I think we can restart. Uh, and by the way, Joe, I think now you understand why we are calling you Target, right? <laughs> because... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it was pretty obvious. <laughs> <laughs> because we have another question, this time from uh, Rodrigo Gouveia. Hi. Thank you, thank you, Joe, for accepting our invitation, and thank you all for, for coming. My question deals with the explanatory gap. Uh, while uh, uh, reading your your classical classic paper from 1983, I, I, I got stuck with this uh, passage in which you, you say that there is more to the concept of pain than its causal role. There is the qualitative character, its qualitative character. And well, in in these pages, you 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 argue that the thing that is not uh, uh, um, explained, so to say, by any mention to physical mechanisms or physical processes, is is something that is left unexplained, as it is something uh, whose connection with uh, physical processes is left completely mysterious to us. Uh, and, and, and this is what you present there as the explanatory gap. I read some of your other work, your book Purple Haze and, and recent stuff on the explanatory gap. And I noticed that, well, the explanatory gap continued to be a, a one important topic for you. And, and it, in a sense, it, it, it continued um, with the essence that was presented in the paper from 1983. So, uh, uh, in a sense, the question was inspired by that paper, but I suppose that it makes sense to ask this now because of what you said in, in your recent work. So, my point is, uh, um, in, that, in that 1983 paper, Besides presenting the explanatory gap, you argue that the explanatory gap accounts for conceivability cases, no? the conceivability of certain scenarios. There you had the Kripkin scenarios in which pain occurred, but not C fibrous stimulation, or C fibrous stimulation, but not pain. And of course, the zombie world case is also some scenario that is presented as being conceivable, and you would say it is conceivable because of an explanatory gap. So I was thinking about certain scenarios which which seem to me to be unconceivable, which may sound strange as I'm presenting them. I conceive <laughs> some unconceivable scenarios. But the idea is that if they are conceivable, at least there is a strong pressure to, to take them as, as so strange that we may not accept them. My, my claim, the bold claim, would be that they are unconceivable. So I'll present three scenarios and then make some comments about uh, uh, my, my conclusions um, in respect to them. The first scenario came after talking with my six-year-old daughter. She, she told me that deer cannot see orange and and that means that in, in a certain region of the world, she saw that in a documentary, deer uh, um, cannot notice that a tiger, a Bengali tiger is approaching because they cannot discern the color of the fur from, from, from the background. And in this particular region, uh, uh, deer uh, protect themselves, these species protect itself by paying attention to the sounds that some monkeys do in the, in the habitat. Then I thought about, well, maybe we could think about a world, a scenario at least, 
uh, uh, a scenario that would be a physical duplicate of the actual world, but in which, uh, 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 trying to, to follow the idea that it is completely mysterious how physical processes relate to, to conscious qualitative states, in this, in this particular world, dear C orange. But since, well, the scenario is, is modeled as a physical duplicate, they behave as if they don't see orange. But they have the qualitative character of seeing orange. Nonetheless, they only uh, protect themselves from the attacks of tigers uh, uh, by hearing the sounds of monkeys. This I take to be a strange case, of course, uh, uh, and I'll try to present two other scenarios uh, in order to claim that this is similar to, to the other two. The third one is, is the one that I take to be the most obvious case that we are dealing with an unconceivable scenario. Uh, the second scenario is very similar to the zombie world, but instead of being um, dark inside, our twins, well, by the way, the, 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 this second scenario should also be a physical duplicate of our world, but our twins there are not dark inside, but they are colorful inside. They have very exuberant uh, qualitative states. Um, maybe they see as good as eagles do, maybe they hear as well as dogs or bats, I don't know, but still uh, since this scenario is built as a physical duplicate of our world, they behave just like we do. They behave as if they didn't had uh, uh, this very exuberant uh, 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 conscious experiences. And, and then I come to the third scenario, which, as I said, at least to me, uh, uh, presents itself as an obvious case of an inconceivable scenario. Maybe I have some theory in mind which uh, uh, takes uh, 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 the idea that we may analyze our folk psychology uh, uh, and, and, and reveal that uh, we have some a priori knowledge of, of the functional uh, role that the different mental states have. But let's keep that out of the, of the discussion, at least now, and, and, and let me present the third case. The third scenario is just as the other two, a physical duplicate of our world. But in this scenario, uh, uh, people um, do not have myopia. So, so, so each one of us, at least our twins, would see things very clearly there without their glasses on. But since this is a physical duplicate of our world, they will put their glasses on, maybe, uh, 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 Maybe they can even uh, 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 pursue their tasks better by putting their glasses on. Maybe this is the reason why zombies, our zombie twins, put their glasses on in the zombie world. But still, the thing is that we know how glasses work. If they put them on, they will get um, a poorer uh, uh, qualitative experience of the world. They will not see as distinct as 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 they would if they were weren't wearing glasses since this is a world where where there there is no myopia uh, i i remembered um, a claim from aristotle in the metaphysics in 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 where he says that sight is the noblest of the senses because it allows us to to achieve more knowledge and, and, and better distinctions. So in a sense, it would be strange for these people to put their glasses. And we can also think about uh, uh, those people that wear thick glasses, they have huge myopia. When they put them on, they will see just a, a big blur. Uh, I am, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that uh, 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 in all these scenarios, the qualitative character of experience would not play any role in determining the behavior of these uh, 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 people, the, the twins or, or the deer and so on. And, and this sounds to me as, as if we were uh, uh, now paying attention to something that we are not considering in the Kripkian cases and also in the zombie world. There is, there is some knowledge, some a priori knowledge that connects um, the 
qualitative character of experience qualia with um, some behavioral outcome. It, it doesn't need to be one specific behavioral outcome, but at least some behavioral outcome. Of course, a, 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 this kind of a, a, a thought may be uh, present an objection to those that think that qualia are epiphenomenal. I, I, I don't suppose that this is this is your view, but at least, uh, uh, well, I would like to, to, to hear from you what do you uh, think about these cases, especially because of what you said in the in the beginning, and this is also something that you 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 published already. Uh, since your recent tendency to to accept or to view a non-materialistic thesis uh, um, as as offering a better explanation, given the the explanatory gap, how how, how would you? Uh, 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 think that all these scenarios would fit in my comments about them in your in your picture. Um, well, thank you for that. Um, well, so le le let's go back to the Joe Levine of the early period <laughs> that you were um, specifically um, talking about. Um, I think that I can make the argument that I did there um, for the claim that the conceivability of these various zombie type scenarios or inversion scenarios, you know, the, the kinds of scenarios that people have always been appealing to when, when being anti-materialist and anti-functionalist using the conceivability argument, my main claim was that the conceivability there was a symptom of there not being an explanation. So the idea was supposed to be, if we really understood what it was about the nature of the physical realization or the functional organization that explained the qualitative character, then it wouldn't be so easy to conceive of a situation where you had that and you didn't have the other. And, and, and I contrasted it with water and its, its properties. If we, once we understand what H2O is, and of course you have to know the surrounding chemistry too, then it's hard to see how you could conceive of something being H2O in a world with our chemical laws, but it doesn't boil at, at you know, 100 degrees centigrade or something. Um, uh, so that was the idea, was to use the conceivability as a symptom of this explanatory gap. Now, I don't think that alone uh, commits me to any metaphysical picture that says what would happen, whether certain scenarios about physically identical worlds where the qualia run crazy, whether they're possible or not, right? So I don't think that initial argument has any direct implications for those sorts of scenarios because and as i put it then look for all i know it really they really are it really is identical to the functional property or the it's just we don't see how it could be true why, why don't we see how or make it intelligible because there's this explanatory gap but that alone i don't see tells me how to think about your deer and and uh, myopia in those cases so that's the first answer, is that I think there isn't a direct implication. But now you may say, okay, but then recently you went and tumbled over to the other side, you know, the forces of darkness and, or no, light, excuse me, forces of light, and, uh, and said, uh, look, the best explanation for the epistemic gap is there is a metaphysical gap, right? That, that, that is that, and indeed, the way I like to think of it is using the framework from functionalism of basic properties and realized properties, right? And the mind-body problem is, as I see it is, is the mental basic or is it realized in the non-mental, all right? So if it's realized in the non-mental, then I want, then that's where you ought to get an explanation then. You know, when A is realized in B, B should provide a, uh, an explanation for 
when you get A. But if A is basic, then you don't expect an explanation, just like whatever the basic parameters that, you know, I mean, I don't know if this is a basic fact in physics anymore or not, that light travels at a, you know, uh, 186,000 miles per second. But if it's a basic fact in physics, then we don't expect it to be explained. That's part of what making it basic means. Um, so one way to get over the problem of these brute correlations is to say, yeah, they're brute because there's two basic phenomena being connected. All right, then you might say, ah, so now what are you going to say about these other scenarios? Because now you're admitting that the qualia can somehow float free, right? Whereas in the other position, I, I didn't have to take the metaphysical stand that allowed these possibilities. You might think now that I'm claiming it's basic in nature, I do. And um, so I want to say, I guess, two or three things about that. Um, first thing is, of course, one has to be very careful and, you know, I mean, we would have to tease out um, what you're really imagining in the deer case and the myopia cases and, and the like, because, it, it, again, physical duplication doesn't just give you um, behavioral duplication. It gives you full functional duplication. So this means all the effects on thoughts and beliefs and emotions and all that stuff has to also be there. All right. Um, it is very possible that there are certain constraints on the phenomenal, right? Like, for instance, take, take the fact that orange seems to be a combination of red and yellow, right? Um, I don't know if that's a priori or not, or I, I don't know to totally what the status of that is. But of course, that we experience it that way, according to at least opponent process theory, gives us some kind of explanation of why orange appears not to be a unique hue, but a, but a binary hue. You know, maybe that's the wrong theory in the end, but, it, but it's a theory that would explain that. Um, now, I don't know that you can just take orange and stick it in a world and have it be orange where it isn't related to red and yellow that way anymore, right? And I don't know that claiming the qualitative character is basic in nature would commit me to a certain kind of atomism about the phenomenal, right? I, I'm just sort of actually thinking of a Lewisian view of possible, right? You've got these atoms and you can recombine them in any way whatsoever. I, I don't know that I would be committed by claiming that the phenomenal is basic in nature to the claim that it's atomistic in that way and can be completely rearranged however you want and then slapped onto any functional organization you might want. Um, I think one has to be careful, you know, one has to really look in the weeds about how you describe the possibilities to see whether someone who makes the claim that I want to make about the basic or fundamental character of conscious experience is really committed to that sort of thing. But then finally, let me get back to something that I said at the end of my introductory remarks. The whole business of trying to work out the metaphysics of identity, uh, the metaphysics of the mind-body problem and the relation between the mental and the physical through the metaphysics of modality um, strikes me as something's fundamentally wrong with that. We're, we're too hung up on that. It, it's not giving us a way. We seem to have this idea that once you've got metaphysical necessity, you might as well have something that's tantamount to identity or something close. And, and then the show is over. There's, and I'm, I'm just not sure about that anymore. I, it seems to me that there might be a kind of relation which allows relations like conscious of acquaintance or whatever I'm taking to be basic to be fundamental in nature but there's no interesting sense of possibility in which they can come apart. But that alone doesn't 
um, undermine the claim that it's still fundamental. Now, that's a metaphysical picture that I've been trying to actually work out. And the book that I was supposed to write in my sabbatical last year would have been written if I had figured out how to do that. But I still can't. But somehow, but that's where my intuition is taking me because I'm finding myself frustrated with what I feel like is being locked inside um, a prison of having to constantly worry about possibility and necessity and feeling like that's not actually what's going, that's not the arena in which this really needs to be played out. But I don't know, I don't know how else, I don't know what a better metaphysical structure might be. Um, so, I mean, that's a current kind of, um, at the end saying, don't bother me with all your possibilities. But, so that's, that, you know, that's not fair. The first two are the real answers to your question. But, but the third is a suspicion that this whole idea of worrying about these other worlds is somehow getting us up on the wrong track. And, um, and, and you know, that's why I alluded to, what do I know about Spinoza? Believe me, nothing. Um, but, um, well, I don't know much about Kant, and yet I talk about him too. So that's okay. Um, but nevertheless, uh, this idea that, look, maybe there's a kind of metaphysical necessity that really isn't tracked uh, by the way we normally do modal, you know, modality. Uh, and that is really the better framework for thinking about the relation between the mental and the physical. I, I also, by the way, the one, another reason I want to go there is that, um, is that uh, I'm very worried about epiphenomenalism in my own position, which I, uh, is constantly a threat. And, um, and in some sense, I, I probably am a kind of epiphenomenalist. And I'm, I, I find that has very unhappy consequences that I don't like. I'd like to think a way out of that. Um, and that's actually the current project I'm working on is trying to, is trying to address these, these issues in my position. Um, so I don't know if that helped, but. No, thank you very much for your, for your answers. Uh, uh, I would, I would just make two, two short comments. Uh, uh, um, when I, when I thought about these scenarios, my, my intention was to, to present scenarios that were not possible, of course, but that they were not even conceivable. My, oh, my, my point is that these scenarios, and, and, and then I take your, your, your answer as a support for, for what I oh, was trying I, to pursue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 it, it doesn't make any sense. There is, there is at least some constraint that uh, uh, um, limits us when we think about physical duplicates that could have a, a crazy distribution of qualia. Uh, and this constraint would would show in a certain way uh, uh, that, well, maybe we know some things about the relation between uh, uh, um, the qualitative character of experience and, and, and the physical um, processes or physical distribution of, of properties, I don't know. Um, but that's it. That's, that, that's well, the... okay. I, I think maybe I, I wasn't actually getting the force of what you were saying. Um, I, well, I, I don't need to go into how I thought, what I thought you were saying. <laughs> uh, given what you just said, th that's actually consistent with another thought I've had, what you were saying, which is, um, uh, well, wait, let me say first. I don't deny that we know a lot about uh, qualitative states. That is, states, you know, just let's, for the moment, just stick with sensory perceptual states, you know, and not worry about whether there's uh, about cognitive and stuff. But I don't deny we know a lot about them. We know a lot about what causes them. We know a lot about the underlying processing that gives rise to them. And I guess what I was thinking has always been the materialist strongest, the cognitive science materialist strongest argument, in fact, against the anti-materialist has been this 
this fact that I think is, is actually what you what you're what you're getting at, which is that the what you might call the fine-tuned structure of experience, and it does have a fine-tuned structure, right? I'll, most of that, in principle, I mean, most of that can be explained by appeal to the underlying computational machinery. Obviously, there are lots of problems <laughs> that are outstanding problems in cognitive science that have not had answers. But people kind of have a sense of what it is to investigate them and what would count as answers. But that was my reason for giving you the example about the opponent process theory and, and seeing orange as a combination of red and yellow. I mean, or take, um, take again, what turns out I gather not to be the right explanation, but nevertheless, suppose it were, of the Mueller liar illusion. So you're having an experience as of, as of one line being longer than the other. Well, we have this explanation in terms of the representational system and the perceptual system saying that the angles when they go in or being interpreted as the thing coming out and when the angles go out and it looks like the thing's going in. So therefore, and it's very complicated, right? So you have to interpret these angles as actually right angles seen, seen in perspective. And then you have to have another computation to the effect that two things that get the same image on the retina, but one's farther away than the other, one must be larger than the other. And now, lo and behold, one looks larger than the other, right? I mean, if you thought phenomenal, and if you think of that as a kind of phenomenal character, the one taking up more of the visual field than the other, right? And if you thought of that as somehow just completely divorced from the underlying functional machinery, you would lose the fact that, oh, this is actually explains why one looks longer than the other. Um, but that said, that doesn't itself completely undermine the consideration, but that would not explain why you're not a zombie doing this. <laughs> I mean, it certainly will explain your behavior on the psychological tests, right? And it will certainly explain why you think one's larger than the other, and it, it can explain a whole bunch of other things. But the one thing it won't explain is why you're, why there's actually anything it's like for you. Um, and I took that to be the explanatory question that's left. But that doesn't mean there isn't a whole lot about the fine-tuned structure of experience that is explained. And that's why it seems to me there has to be a very close connection, a very intimate connection between the st structure of our experience and the, and the, and the structure of our perceptual and motor and well, all these systems. Um, but the standard functionalist realization notion doesn't give you, doesn't quite capture it because it doesn't, it still leaves this explanatory question um, up, unresolved. Uh, right, we have a follow up by Terry. Can you go on? Oh, sorry. You to, oh, now there you're on mute. Okay. okay. Uh, I just wanted to say I, I find Rodrigo's uh, cases really intriguing. <laughs> I want to encourage you to do something with those, Rodrigo, if you haven't already. Uh, but I had a couple thoughts about this. Um, suppose, and I, I think this is maybe independent of whether one wants to go the materialist, naturalist way or not. Um, Leave, leave that aside for the moment. The interesting question, first and foremost, is whether these cases are conceivable. That's what you said is the issue you're really pressing on. Um, well, one way to think about uh, the causal efficacy of uh, the phenomenal is to think in terms of some kind of supervenient causation. So you've got an underlying physical story going on. You're supposing that the phenomenal is not literally identical to the physical, or let's let us at least suppose that for the moment. Um, and on some pictures, if you have the right kind of systematic supervenience connections with 
the pertinent kind of modal strength, then um, the supervenient features will be causally efficacious as well. They won't be merely epiphenomenal. Well, one might say, yeah, that's true as long as there's a pertinent kind of systematic interconnection between uh, the physical and the phenomenal so that uh, the, the pertinent effects are appropriate to the phenomenal, right? Suppose they're not, and that seems to be what's really distinctive about your cases, right? These critters are behaving the same way as they do in the actual world, despite the fact that their phenomenal character doesn't seem to be right for that. In some cases, their phenomenal character is better, but they're not making use of their really good visual acuity or their amazing ability to use so, you know, sonar type, whatever it is, echolocation detection like bats. In other cases, uh, their acuity is much worse, but they're behaving just like us anyway. So there's this peculiar mismatch between uh, the phenomenal character and the physical goings on and the underlying computational machinery that's driving the physical goings on. But one thing you might say is, I can conceive of that all right, but that wouldn't be a world in which supervenient causation holds. You know, uh, The cost of such, of such a conceivable scenario is that there, the phenomenal stuff would be entirely epiphenomenal. And you could say that about your cases, even if you think that the right thing to say about um, phenomenal character for critters like us is that you've got supervenient causation. That was my thought. That's a way of saving conceivability, but, but still conceding that there's something distinctively weird about your cases. I really like the cases. Thank you, Terry. Uh, uh, just as a as a short comment, uh, uh, what I uh, uh, am trying, I'm not clear that these cases would be unconceivable. Uh, uh, they seem to be unconceivable. There seems to be a pressure to take them as unconceivable, and 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 the reason would be that in spite of the zombie world being claimed as being conceivable, uh, epiphenomenalist just uh, uh, goes against. Uh, sort of an a priori truth, uh, 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 and, and, and this seems to be, we, we simply take conscious states to be causally efficacious. Um, but as, as I said, this is also something that I, I, I was thinking about inspired by Joe's explanatory gap. Um, so let me just uh, comment a bit on that exchange right. um, yeah. quickly. Uh, so I guess um, I guess what I was I think in light of Terry's remarks, what I might want to say about what I was trying to say earlier is that while um, uh, while the idea that if you if you're especially you think the explanatory gap shows some kind of metaphysical gap, while the idea that therefore it ought to be possible to imagine a physically identical world where the qualia get mixed up in various ways of the kind that you were talking about, uh, might seem to follow immediately um, and be conceivable. And again, with Terry, I, I, I think maybe these things are conceivable that you're talking about. But what I'm not sure about is whether it would really be orange or whether it would really be the spatial, the, the, that is the experiential character would really be properly described by the same spatial kinds of terminology that we use now to describe ours. That is, those things may be rooted already in, in, the, uh, in the kinds of functional relations that um, seem to be, um, you know, seem to govern them. And so it's a, it's a little harder to know in these other cases whether you should just give new names to all these 
qualia or still call them the same ones that we have in this world it's not it's not clear to me how, how you how you would fall down on that question uh well thank you all uh we're gonna move on now to terry horgan's question okay i'm gonna Well, let me start by also thanking the organizers for organizing this great event and for inviting me. And I'm really sorry that it couldn't have happened in person the way originally planned. Uh, I'm taking a kind of uh, what you might call um, broad, rather narrow conception of what constitutes a single question. <laughs> Maybe it's a multi-dimensional question. <laughs> I have several questions really, but I think they're interrelated. And I did send them to Joe a couple of days ago so he could think about it. I wanted to start by quoting a great passage that I really like a lot. Um, I found this in a paper by Peter Bieri from 1995 called, Why is Consciousness Puzzling? In a collection by, edited by Thomas Metzinger called Conscious Experience. Um, and this is a passage that is quoted by Bieri from the German. It's Bieri's own translation. Um, the 19th century physician and physiologist, Emil Heinrich Dubois Raymond, who apparently was the co-discoverer of nerve action potential and the, develop, the developer of experimental electrophysiology. And here's how he expressed his belief that phenomenal consciousness can just must does and must elude physical chemical explanation. Here's the passage quoted. What conceivable connection is there between certain movements of certain atoms in my brain on one side and on the other, the original indefinable undeniable facts. I feel pain, feel lust. I taste sweetness smell the scent of roses, hear the sound of organ, see redness. It is entirely and forever incomprehensible why it should make a difference how a set of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, etc., atoms are arranged and moved, how they were arranged and moved, how they will be arranged and will move. It is in no way intelligible how consciousness might emerge from their coexistence. And this is something that Dubois Raymond wrote in 1872. I think that's really a marvelous articulation of what Joe calls the explanatory gap. And it's striking that, you know, figures who were already important in the 19th century understanding the physical basis of consciousness, the physical basis of mentality we're already, you know, strongly feeling the force of the explanatory gap, captures it very nicely. Now, one thought I've had myself persistently over the years is this. Not only does there seem not to be any satisfying explanation of why any particular physical or functional state of my brain should be accompanied by the specific phenomenal character or what its likeness that it actually does accompany it, or any at all for that matter, any what it's likeness at all. But I can't even conceive of what an explanation like that might consist in. I can't form a clear conception of what could explain that. Um, so one question I have for Joe is, do you have that thought as well at this point in your philosophical evolution? Now, a second thought that I've had more and more over the years, and especially lately, is this. Maybe the right metaphysical story about phenomenal consciousness is one under which there is no genuine explanatory issue here, even though almost inevitably there seems to be such an explanatory issue. Um, a question I have for Joe is, do you perhaps have this thought too at this point in your philosophical evolution? 
And now I've got a third two-part question concerning two related thoughts that I've had, especially just lately. Uh, before I do this one, I should say that I've always been pulled in two directions. As Joe says, he's always been in pulled, or pulled in two directions. But I've consistently called myself a wannabe materialist. I want some kind of phenom I want some kind of materialist story about phenomenal consciousness. And I've never felt that anything that's been there in the philosophical literature does the job. But I'm still pulled toward some kind of materialism. Um, although I do think that. Uh, a very respectable kind of position is one that basically says that physical phenomenal connections are brute. Um, I, I see that as a kind of emergentism, and I think it's a philosophically respectable view. Maybe it's the one that Joe himself is more pulled toward lately. But here's here's what I, the kind of thought I've been pulled toward, especially lately, two parts to it. First, maybe the phenomenal consciousness properties with their intrinsic what it's likeness are literally identical to certain intrinsic physical chemical properties that are instantiable by physically complex creatures like humans. Now, that would be very different from some kind of functionalist story that says that all there is to um, a mental property insofar as it's mental, and this would include phenomenal properties, all there is to a phenomenal property insofar as it's distinctively mental is its functional role. Uh, that has long seemed to me to be a non-starter. So what I'm talking about is a possible version of type-type identity theory, which is not functionalist in that way. I mean, you can be a functionalist and still be a type-type identity theorist. That's the kind of view that David Lewis held and that David Armstrong held. They held that mental concepts are functional concepts. All there is to the concept of a mental state, including the concept of a phenomenal mental state, <laughs> is that it's the concept of a state that plays a certain kind of distinctive functional role in the system. And then they were identity theorists because they said the states that play those roles um, are physical states. That's not the kind of identity theory I'm talking about. I'm talking about a view that it acknowledges and insists on the idea that phenomenal properties, at least, are intrinsic qua mental. What its likeness is an intrinsic mental aspect of phenomenal experiences. Uh, it is the psychological um, categorical basis for the pertinent functional role that phenomenal states play. But there's more to phenomenality than functional character because it is intrinsic. So this is a kind of identity theory that would acknowledge that and would identify mental properties with, would identify phenomenal properties with their intrinsic what it's likeness with certain intrinsic physical properties uh, that are instantiable by certain kinds of complex creatures like us. So that's one thought that I've been having lately. And a related thought would be this. Maybe then the pertinent kinds of identity facts are simply not susceptible to explanation and they don't need explanation. Um, the relevant concepts we deploy when we think of a mental well, phenomenal property as such, that's, that's a phenomenal concept. It's a very different concept from thinking of it as a intrinsic physical property. But both kinds of concepts are rigid concepts, so they're not just like the concept of a certain sort of functional role property. Then you could explain why it is that a certain physical property plays that functional role. No, no, we're talking about a, um, a rigid 
phenomenal concept, a rigid physical concept. They're both concepts of an intrinsic state, a property with intrinsic character. They're, they rigidly refer to the same thing. And there's no need to explain that because it is a non-explainable and non-needing explanation kind of identity fact. So just lately, that kind of identity theory has been appealing to me. One might still be able to explain why there seems to be an explanatory gap. This is the familiar uh, phenomenal concept strategy. There seems to be because the two kinds of concepts are so importantly different and even conceptually independent. So a question I have for Joe is, do you have this kind of thought too at this point in your philosophical career? So that's my multi-part question. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the first two. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, just give me a very quick reminder of what the first two were. Okay. I I wrote it down, and I was actually looking at my own text. So yeah, I'll yeah, but back to it the first one the first thought was um i can't even conceive of what could constitute uh, a satisfying explanation right and the second thought was um perhaps there isn't really a genuine explanatory issue at all oh okay the thought was trying to kind of put meat on the bones of the first two so um I, I certainly do have that thought. I, I have no idea what an explanation would be like. And I've had that view, I think, from the original paper, actually. I think I may have put it there and said um, that it's somehow not even intelligible to us how. Um, well, there I was I was talking about how it could be a physical state. But, uh, but, but part of the idea was it just wasn't clear at all to me. Um, it seemed to me that the only kinds of explanations we can get uh, um, are the kinds that um, um, I can't remember the name of the German neurophysiologist or, but anyway, the kind of stuff, he, uh, precisely what he what he was capturing. And if I had just read that, I could have avoided forty years of writing. Anyway, um, but. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, let me just say, yeah, I, I'm not sure how else to expand on that. I, I certainly have that have that view. Now, the the what you bring up about, well, maybe there really isn't an explanatory question here and and then marry it a bit with the phenomenal concept strategy. Um, so that's that's actually been um, an issue I've worried about for some time and. And actually, I remember <laughs> specifically in um, in the very papers where I was um, uh, disagreeing with Chalmers about the sort of semantic kind of argument, semantic slash modal argument he would give from the conceivability premise to derive um, the anti-materialist conclusion. The one kind of um, uh, um, arc in that dialectic was uh, his side, let's call it, as I was developing the dialectic, um, his side would say, um, look, the identity itself needs an explanation. And my response to that was that that is, um, I'm sorry, the way the arc went, I, I, I'm trying to avoid getting too much into the weeds on this, but it's hard to say what I'm going to say without. I was trying to claim that, look, you don't have you don't have the same problem in the water H2O case, but in the water H2O case too, you don't get the kind of uh, derivation because I didn't think the concept of wa water, I, I was treating it more like photo as a as a as a um, atomic concept and therefore um the water e equals h2o doesn't follow 
in the way that he, that he and Jackson think it does from certain a priori conceptual analyses together with a little bit of empirical information. I was disputing that model. And and they and the sort of re response was, well, but you need to explain the identity water equals H2O. And if, and if you don't have a conceptual analysis of water in terms of a certain causal role, you can't explain that identity. And my response to that was, identities themselves don't need explanations. Identity is a brute relation, right? Um, it doesn't make sense to ask why water is H2O. Now, there are explanatory questions in the vicinity. There's the question, why believe water is H2O? And for that, it seems to me you give an inference of the best explanation. You say, claim, uh, believing that it does, positing that it is H2O, explains its behavior. That's a reason to believe it's H2O. So that's, that's the sort of justificatory question that you can answer about an identity. And then there's a kind of how possible question. And I imagined a person like Aristotle who thought that water was a basic substance that was um, infinitely divisible could ask, well, how could something that's infinitely divisible be the same thing as something that's made up of these particles? And then, of course, that I, uh, and that wouldn't really be a why is water H2O, that would be more of how could water be H2O, but that's, after all, very close to the explanatory back question too, right? How could a phenomenal state be a physical state? And of course, in the water H2O case, the answer is to tell Aristotle he was wrong in his conception of water. It turns out what needs to be explained here is not how an infinitely divisible substance could be made of molecules. No, that can't be explained because that's impossible. What can be explained is how something made of molecules can appear to be infinitely divisible. And of course, that we do have an explanation of, right, in terms of the small size and the way the molecules move and all that stuff. So once you get rid of those two, then the mere question, how could water be H2O or how could Mark Twain be Samuel Clemens strikes one as, as absurd. One doesn't know what you're asking for in such cases. So I said to myself, self, why are you having so much trouble then with uh, pain and sea fiber firing? Why isn't it just the same thing? And in Purple Haze, I actually said, but look, it isn't. That is, we really do not understand what's, I mean, if somebody once is given all the science about water, asks you why water is H2O, I, I find myself, or how water could be H2O, I find myself at a loss to have any conception of what they're asking anymore. I mean, are they asking a semantic question? I mean, there are semantic questions too. You know, does water pick out H2O or something? That's a different story. Um, but we know, we all know what people are asking <laughs> when they ask the question about pain and sea fiber firing and, 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 and the like. So um, I said, look, there just seem to be certain identities that are gappy and others that aren't. And a gap by a gappy identity, I meant one that, for which a kind of how, how, why kind of question seems to still be appropriate. Now, that's just to name the difference. That's not to give an account of the difference or to explain how such a thing could arise. So more recently, I've been trying to assimilate the, um, and this is where, you know, David Papineau said, so it's not really an explanatory gap. It's really just an intuition of distinctness. And it's just an intuition. Just give it up. Um, and for a while, I was thinking, yeah, maybe intuition of distinctness really is what's going on here. But now I really like to go back to the how possible formulation. And here's, and, and this connects a bit with the phenomenal concept strategy, because um, I don't think the mere... Uh, so on the phenomenal concept strategy, I don't think the mere having atomic concepts that rigidly refer but are distinct representations helps because we do find that in other places. We find it, uh, I mean, take, take a demonstrative and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and another description like if, if somebody said, I ask, where are we? Of course I know we're here. 
what do I want to know? I want to know what street we're on or something. And then somebody gives a street address. It would be a very weird thing to wonder how here could be that street address. I mean, um, I, I, I don't know what would you'd be wondering about unless you have this other background belief that you were way far away from that area and uh, which would be a different kind of question but how here could be picked out as a location on a map doesn't strike me as a question that i can even get started whereas this one i can so what i think is the how possible issue here is we seem to have a kind of presence or acquaintance with the qualities that make up our phenomenal experience that don't seem like it doesn't seem like the kind of relation that we can bear to these other kinds of properties and so i want to know is like how can a motion of molecules be the kind of thing that i could be acquainted with in this way that presents a certain quality to me when as far as I know from everything else about it, it's merely this sort of causal chain of things. So the way I get an, uh, an explanatory question to remain is, um, is by um, turning it into the idea that there's, there is some kind of, of barrier that, to accepting the identity that involves a kind of how possible question. Um, I know there's a huge question that just came to me from Gabrielle. Oh, forget about that's a question <laughs> to be asked later from oh, people right. on YouTube. Because <laughs> I can't possibly read and talk at the same time, yes. Um, okay, anyway, that, so I don't know if that was helpful or not. But. Uh, oh, Gabrielle, you need to unmute Terry. Oh, did you say something, Terry? So I did. I said it's helpful. It's helpful. Um, it, All right. It, uh, it, maybe I'll say one more thing. The, the, this dialectic, I think, can be somewhat reframed if it turns out to be a dialectic where both parties agree that uh, phenomenal character is an intrinsic feature of phenomenal conscious, phenomenally conscious states, intrinsic qua mental. Um, so that both, both sides agreed that uh, orthodox functionalist story won't fly for phenomenal properties. And a version of type type identity theory like that of Armstrong and Lewis won't fly because they claimed that all there is to um, a, a mental property as such, including a phenomenal property, is its characteristic functional role. Nothing intrinsic about it is part of what it is qua mental. Um, if both if both parties to the current dialectic agree that those kind of positions are not plausible, then I think the dialectic looks interestingly different because the functionalist approach is being put firmly behind, firmly repudiated, at least for phenomenal properties. Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, you have anything more to say? I, I'm going to move to the last debater's question. That, that, that's fine. All right. So uh, now it's with you, Professor Mendonça. No. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. first of all, well, uh, let me say that I'm very pleased to be with you. Sorry about that. Don't worry. But as I was saying, I'm very, I'm very pleased to be with you in this, at least up to this point, terrific meeting. I'm happy for being able to see and talk to Joe Levin 
eight years after we met in the Rio 2013 Phenomenal Concepts Conference. Uh, there I also met Martina Nida Rumelin, and I am very happy for being able to interact, if, even if only virtually, with Charles Seward, Terry Horgan, and my Brazilian colleagues, Marco and Rodrigo. I now go straight to my question, as I wouldn't like to run to later run out of time. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll have to read uh, my, my, my contribution to this debate here, because I think this is, okay, better. I can manage uh, to, to convey the ideas I would like to convey. Anyway, I asked, you from, I ask from you uh, a tolerant attention, as I am, of course, no native speaker of English. Okay. I would like to address in these comments Joseph Levin's treatment of a much discussed problem in the meta ethical literature uh, the so called explanatory argument from supervenience. In a nutshell, the problem is this. <clears throat> By endorsing the claim that the ethical domain supervenes on the natural domain, metaethical realists commit themselves to the obtaining of model facts, that is, to the obtaining of metaphysically necessary links between natural properties and ethical properties, whereby natural facts metaphysically necessitate ethical facts. Moreover, Metaphysically model facts require explanation. They cannot be seen as inexplicable, brute facts. This poses a challenge for metaethical non-naturalists. While the naturalistic view, according to which ethical properties are reducible, ultimately identical to natural properties, can easily account for the model facts entailed by ethical supervenience, it is, to put it mildly, exceedingly difficult to see how the non-naturalist working under the assumption that ethical properties are radically distinct from natural properties should proceed to deliver the required explanation. Being sympathetic to meta-ethical non-naturalism, Levin thinks that it must be possible to satisfactorily meet the challenge posed by the explanatory argument. And he makes an ingenious proposal to find a way around this metaphysical problem. <clears throat> to better appreciate the force of our problem, let us consider the form it takes when the supervenience framework is applied to the case of phenomenal mind. The relevant notion of supervenience in this case is a strong supervenience, a doubly model modelized correlation between phenomenal properties on the one hand and physical properties on the other. The strong supervenience says that as a matter of conceptual necessity, whenever something has a phenomenal property F, it has a natural property G. And it is metaphysically necessary that everything that has G also has F. The challenge here consists in explaining the necessary asymmetric connection between each specific physical property G and the corresponding phenomenal property F. Horgan and Timmons call each, co each connection of this sort a specific supervenience fact. It is generally accepted by non-naturalists and materialists alike that each element of this series is in need of an explanation. And again, materialists, for whom there is no metaphysical distinction between phenomenal facts and physical facts, can easily discharge the task at hand. The fact, if it is a fact, 
that phenomenal properties are reducible to physical properties explains why the latter necessitates the former. But of course, this sort of explanation is of no use for the non-materialists, as we have no idea how to find an, and we have no idea how to find an explanation compatible with the non-materialist worldview. This still leaves one admittedly radical possibility open for the non-materialists, namely to deny the very idea of the strong supervenience of the phenomena on the natural. Without the strong supervenience, there are no metaphysically moral facts, no necessitating relation, no necessitation relations requiring explanation. Indeed, this seems to be the choice of Chalmers and many other influential non-materialists, among them Levin himself. Can now the meta-ethical non-naturalist, in her response to the explanatory argument, make a move analogous to the radical move made by the non-materialist? Can the meta-ethical non-naturalist deny the strong supervenience of the ethical on the natural? Levin makes a particularly good case for answering this question with a clear no. Levin sticks to the claims, one, that there are moral facts about the necessitation of supervenient properties, supervenient properties, in the present case ethical properties, by subvenient properties, in the present case natural properties. Two, that these moral facts require explanation, and three, that appeals to brute necessities are unacceptable. In contrast to what he says in the case of mind, Levin claims that the challenge, the challenge posed by the explanatory argument in the ethical case can be met without giving up the strong supervenience. The key to the proposal advanced by Levin is the claim that the evaluative procedure, the standard of evaluation, guiding our attribution of an ethical property to a naturalistically characterized object, for instance, an action type, constitutes the very ethical property in question. A particular instantiation of an ethical property is what results when we apply a function embodying the standard of evaluation to a particular instantiation of a natural property. Moreover, and this is the crucial point, Levin maintains that there is an internal relation between the standard of evaluation and the nature of the instantiated ethical property. The ethical property is constitutively determined by the standard. As the standard of evaluation shouldn't be confounded with a naturalistic lawful regularity, ethical properties are naturalistic irreducible. <clears throat> This ensures the right, albeit still contextually restricted, connections between natural properties, the input of the function, and properties which are something over and above the, nat the natural, the ultimate. These connections are contextually restricted because they hold only in the situation in which our attribution of ethical properties is guided by the standard of evaluation de facto accepted by the situated agents. The next step consists in determining the standards in a way 
that it applies in any situation, in any possible world. Accordingly, Levin stipulates that the intended standard of evaluation is, I quote, the objectively correct moral theory. It seems that if we put the pieces together, we finally have the long-awaited, non-naturalist-friendly explanation of the moral facts entailed by strong supervenience. The appeal to a standard of evaluation playing a constitutive role vis-à-vis -vis the properties whose instantiations it determines ensures the right alignment of naturalistic irreducible ethical facts and natural facts. Furthermore, as the standard of evaluation is determined by the correct moral theory, the established alignment remains stable in all situations across all possible worlds. <clears throat> I would not like to make a somehow critical observation concerning Levin's ingenious treatment of the explanatory argument. Let us suppose that my ethical reasoning is guided by the standard of evaluation determined by straightforward act utilitarianism, which I take to be a correct moral theory. Let us further suppose that the standard of evaluation operative in your case reflects the doctrine of the categorical imperative, which, in your view, is also a correct theory. Although we, of course, don't know which is the objectively correct theory, assuming that there is such a thing, each of us believes that we are on the right track. Under these circumstances, we can only expect that the ethical properties constituted by my standards are different from the ethical properties resulting from the application of your standards. Now the question is, which are the real ethical properties? Mine or the yours or yours. If act utilitarianism is the de facto, de facto correct moral theory, then I have been all the time thinking and talking about the real thing. <clears throat> Genuine ethical or moral properties, while you have been referring only to schmoral properties. Should we wait until the debate in normative ethics involving inter alia consequentialists and deontologists is over to finally decide or discover what we are after all talking about when we engage in ethical discussions? Alternatively, could we come to the relativistic conclusion that my ethical properties are as real as yours? And what if we abandon the idea of the objectively correct moral theory and endorse instead the idea that ethical properties are constituted by the common core of all acceptable moral theories. Now, one could think that this is no different from what happens when we think and talk about water. All the time, we have been talking about a very definite thing, namely H2O. But that it is, but that it is exactly H2O that we have been talking about all this time, this we know now, since the research into the microstructure of water is over. If this is okay, 
Then what was said above on our ignorance of the real nature of ethical property doesn't pose a serious objections, a serious objection to living living living's account, the account of the way the ethical relates to the natural. But it isn't entirely okay. If we follow living, the case of ethical properties is quite different from natural properties. Instantiations of the pro property of being H2O, for instance, are determined by their causal lawful relations to instantiations of other natural properties. But unlike the standard of evaluation that Levin has in mind, that is the standard applicable in the ethical domain, the fallible standards we mobilize to uncover the relations among instantiations of natural properties don't ever enter into the constitution of the properties they help to reveal. <clears throat> According to Levin, the role played by standards of evaluation in the constitution of the properties whose instantiations they help determine is what sets ethical properties apart from natural properties. By the way, also from phenomenal properties. It seems to me that the account based on this idea leave some relevant questions open, which are naturally raised by the attempt to describe or to capture what is going on while we operate with different standards of evaluation without knowing whether they embody the objectively correct moral theory, assuming again that there is such a thing. That's it. I thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> well, thank you for that and also for uh, reading that paper. I didn't know anybody had read that paper. Uh, <laughs> um, and so uh, I, I'm not sure I totally understand exactly what it what it is you're asking, but so I'll say stuff. And then if you tell me I'm not quite getting at it, um, get back to me. Um, but just to put it in some context for, for everybody else, something that had always puzzled me as a young philosopher <clears throat> for years on, um, I don't do ethics, uh, unlike Terry, I don't do everything. Um, so I, I, uh, you know, didn't have any special competence in metaethics or anything. But every now and again, I go to my metaethical colleagues and I'd say, you know, there's this funny asymmetry. In philosophy of mind, supervenience in, in the mind-body problem, materialism, anti-materialism, supervenience was, at least for many years, the gold standard. This is what we argued about. If you could establish supervenience, that was a win for materialism. If you are going to be an anti-materialist, you're going to deny supervenience. All the stuff about the conceivability argument, right, um, has that character. I said, but here you go into ethics, you have E.G. Moore telling you that good is supervenient on the, on the descriptive, and yet it's still supposed to be something over and above. Why is that an okay position in metaethics and not uh, an okay position in uh, philosophy of mind? And then, of course, after I asked that enough times, people said, you know, there's a literature about this. And so I, I started to read it, but and I, and I came across this challenge. So I myself, for having nothing to do with just generally hating materialism or anything, I just happen to be also a non-naturalist about the moral. I, I, um, I think there's an ought maybe good as well, but let's for the moment think about ought, that something you ought to do, the oughtness is over and above anything about the, that can be handled descriptively. Um, on the other hand, it seems pretty clear you get two descriptively identical worlds, and what you ought to, 
to do in one seems to tell you what you ought to do in the other. It seems real. Unlike, see, that's the thing. Unlike the conceivability arguments for um, for it, ga- regarding the phenomenal, it seems you know the problem is it seems so all too conceivable that you could have a physically identical world, and maybe maybe not Rodrigo's cases, but at least you know standard inversion cases and then zombie cases. Those seem all too conceivable. Um, and then, then of course, the debate is whether their conceivability shows they're really possible, and so that's where that debate goes. But in metaethics, nobody seems to think a world that's exactly like ours is one in which Hitler is a good guy. I mean, that seems grotesque, right? Right. Whereas that green should be red, that seems okay, right? Why is it okay in the one case and not in the other? Now, the naturalist. And again, I'm thinking of by naturalism in ethics, I'm understanding the idea that the normative is in some sense reducible to the descriptive. It doesn't matter what the descriptive is. That could all be ghosts for all I care. It's just the thing is it's non-normative. So um, uh, the non-naturalist in that case, right, what are they gonna, so they've been challenged. Either you think the supervenience involves a brute necessity, which, some people are okay with, I myself admit I'm not okay with that. Um, or you should be a reductivist and then the, then the supervenience can be explained. So what I had in mind by way of an answer um, was not meant to engage the aspect uh, that Wilson mentioned about, well, what if there are two different standards of evaluation? I was um, uh, just wondering about uh, or actually, I wasn't really trying to establish the position that there is an objective morality. I believe that, uh, and I believe there's a, a right standard. And by the way, it's mine, not yours. Um, uh, but um, but that wasn't really what I was trying to establish. I was trying to establish is somebody who has a view like that. How do they handle this explanatory question? about supervenience. You know, whether whether they have good arguments for why there should should be in a, a single epi- uh, a moral standard or not, I took to be somewhat orthogonal to, to this question. So the, the answer I gave was, um, look, there's something different involved in an ought or in a, in a moral property that's very different from, say, um, phenomenal properties in that and ought is, um, I think of it as like a function that needs an argument, right? It, it is an evaluative um, uh, property, one that takes another property and then spits out a value. So what a ought is, is it says, so you imagine the standard of oughtness going around and looking at situations and saying, okay, that situation, run it through my my functional machinery that is the machinery that says what you ought to do, whether it be the categorical imperative, you know, the original position or whatever it is, um, shows you where my sympathies are. But, um, you know, you run it through that and then it spits out, is this what you ought to do or not what you ought to do? Is this just, is this not just, whatever. But that on its own, it can't attach to anything without having an input, which is a, a, a description. So if you take the same standard, and that's why I wasn't worrying about alternative standards, if you take the same standard from this world to a physically identical world, of course it has to spit out the same um, answer because it's a function. It gives you a single answer for a single argument. Now, the problem I did notice is, um, okay, so then Nevertheless, if you say that it's really something over and above, if the moral is really something over and above, or the norm, morally normative, really something over and above the descriptive, maybe by claiming that what it is is a kind of standard that requires an input, and therefore for any two inputs that are identical, you're going to get the same output, maybe that explains the supervenience that you get 
the level of supervenience which says, look, Hitler can't be good. But what about the possibility of a zombie moral world? That is a, a world where there just aren't any moral properties. That moral properties have to apply in a world. That is, maybe there can't be, maybe on the account I gave, there can't be a world in which Hitler's good. But could there be a world in which Hitler is just neither good nor bad? There just is no good or bad in that world. And I don't remember actually what I concluded in that paper, because but where I am now is, is one of two options. One option is to say, yeah, maybe that is possible. That is, in a certain sense, the whole question about the supervenience of the normative on the descriptive, really, we really only care about getting divergent judgments. The idea of a possible world in which there just are no moral properties strikes me as maybe possible. One thing is maybe that's possible. It won't seem conceivable to us because we're in a world with moral properties and we can't help but give a moral judgment on something that's that that's just not a world that's fundamentally like our world. And and I noticed that, you know, that's not that doesn't strike me as the thing that both meta ethicists need to go to the mat on is whether there's really a possible world where in some sense no moral properties are instantiated at all. All I think what they really care about is divergent uh, moral judgments. But the other way of going is to say, look, maybe it actually is just metaphysically necessary that moral properties exist in every world. Um, in the way that numbers may be, metaf you know, it's necessary they exist in every world. And if that's true, then they're automatically going to take the values they take in those worlds, and then you won't have uh, uh, an explanatory problem. So that's sort of where I am at at this point. Did I respond to your question? Unmuting. Well, okay. Well, in a sense, yes. <laughs> in another sense, no. But maybe well, that's I, because I, like I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get uh, your <clears throat> your idea rightly. But I must say, before I, I, I make some comments to, uh, to, to your comments, that you seem to have, you seem to have uh, more, more, more readers, uh, at least regarding this paper, in Brazil than in your country, because you said no one, no one read this paper, this basicness and supervenience. And I must say that I came to, to, to this paper uh, by an indication by Barodrigo, Rodrigo read this paper <laughs> and told me I should I should read this paper. Then you had read two readers of your paper here in Brazil at least. Oh. Okay, no, the paper is very interesting, and I, but I, uh, I, I, it occurs to me that when describing the situation as you see, you left aside uh, a point which I which I, I think it, it's very important in your paper. And the point is that ethical properties are constituted by the standards of evaluation which determine the instantiations of these properties. Right. That is, instanti uh, standards of evaluation are very different from, from other uh, standards uh, which determine for instance, relations between natural properties, because the standards of evaluation contribute decisively to the constitution of the very properties that are ascribed to, 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 to natural objects, let's say like this. I think this is the main point, for my, for my view, uh, this is the main point, this is what distinguishes ethical properties from natural properties, and by the way, also from, from, from phenomenal properties. And this point is what makes possible to accept a strong supervenience in the ethical case, to actual uh, the idea of brute necessities, that is, to accept 
strong supervenience and to deliver an explanation for the model facts, which are entailed by, by strong supervenience. Huh? And, of course, the explanation of these facts is difficult only when you uh, adopt and you endorse the non-naturalist point of view, because you have then uh, necessary connections between properties which are uh, entirely distinct. Uh, natural properties on the one hand and ethical properties on the other hand. Because if they aren't distinct, if you endorse the point of view of the naturalist, then you have no problem at all uh, when you try to explain these necessary connections. But if you say the very nature of the property, the ethical property, is constituted by the standard of evaluation, uh, then you have, as the output of this function embodying the, the, the standard of evaluation, then you have a naturalistic irreducible property. And since this property is the output of this function, and the input is a natural property or a natural description, as you mentioned in the case of ought. Okay, anyway, let's, let's put like that. A, 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 a natural property as input and an ethical property as the output. And this is the output which the function embodying the, the standard of evaluation renders. Now, if this standard of evaluation cannot be confounded with some sort of, 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 of lawful regular, uh, regularity, huh? uh, if it is really, in a sense, uh, free-floating, huh? then the property, the output, of this function is naturalistic irreducible. And the output is, of course, aligned, rightly aligned to the natural property that functions as, as, as the input. Now, if this is standard, moreover, if this is standard of evaluation, uh, beyond constituting uh, the, 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 the property itself that appears on the output. If this standard of evaluation holds in all possible worlds, in all possible situations, and this is how I understand your talk of uh, the objectively correct moral theory, then you have a, an explanation for the model fact, the model fact that necessary the, 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 uh, the natural property, the realizer, let's put in the realizer of the ethical property in question, uh, determines in all possible worlds the term the same uh, uh, moral, uh, ethical property. I find this this explanation. Uh, uh, this is somehow. Uh, this is this is by the way something new. I I I I, I know no other uh, position in meta ethics that uh, requires this constitutive role for standards of evaluation. And I think this is a very good idea, but. Uh, the idea that the standard, that the, the nature of ethical properties are constituted by the standards of evaluation we use uh, is, in, is very interesting, but 
This must be the standards of evaluation that we use. Huh? And the fact is that we use different standards of evaluation. Huh? As I tried to mention in my, to, to describe in, in, in my example, I may be an act utilitarianism, and you are a deontologist, and of course our standards are different, and of course the output of our uh, evaluation of standards will be different for the same natural property. And then I thought we have a problem. I thought we have a problem. Because if the output is different, and the output is the ethical property itself, the output is not, not, not the output is not only the, the determination of the instantiation of the property. The property is constituted by the standard of evaluation. Then I am constituting different properties from the ones you are constituting. And, and, and there I think that there is a problem. Unless Maybe this is an alternative. I, I, I would like to, to, to suggest that maybe this is an alternative. You don't have to invoke the objectively moral, uh, the objectively moral, objectively correct moral theory to... Uh, to fix a, 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 a single nature uh, for, the, for the ethical properties in question. Uh, maybe you could take recourse to something like the core, the core, the common core of all accepted moral theories. And now, of course, this way we can maybe rule out your example, that there is a world in which Hitler is a good guy, no? from the moral point of view, let's say. No, because <clears throat> uh, only if you operate with an unacceptable moral theory, you would get this result. Of course, it's very difficult to say exactly when a moral theory is acceptable. But from my point of view, I think we can say that although they are different, the act utilitarianist theory is acceptable. And the theory uh, of the doctrine of the, the categorical imperative is also acceptable. But it's not acceptable, a theory that results in the fact that Hitler is a good guy. That's, I would like to... I think <clears throat> I can accept all that for the purposes that I... Um, it was uh, for the per for the goals I had in that paper. <clears throat> I um, but you are bringing up a, an issue that is that I I did discuss at the end and said I do think, however, and I, I think this is connected with the alternative standards problem. I I said look, I was trying to give uh, by saying look, moral properties are essentially evaluative. That makes them already very different from descriptive properties because an evaluation is like a function that has to have something to evaluate. And if it's a well-ordered kind of evaluative standard, then it will be a function. It'll always give you the same value for the same uh, descriptive input. But on this question of which, whether there are objective moral standards and also how we would know how we would settle disagreements uh, about which are the which is the right standard or not that is a different question and so what i was suggesting at the end of the article is 
The real problem for the non-naturalist is moral epistemology, not moral metaphysics. And I do think there are some real problems for the non-naturalist, even though I'm inclined in that direction, but I nevertheless it, it shoulder the burden of what my epistemology is going to be about um, moral properties if they're non-natural. And that, of course, puts us in the position of always wondering whether our standards are the same. But notice that what's really crucial, at least for my purposes, is, is that if you're an act utilitarian, then all you're going to have the same judgment about all descriptively identical worlds. If you're a Kantian, you're going to have the same judgment about all of them. Of course, you won't have the same judgment as the Kantian, and the Kantian won't have the same judgment as you. There are going to be, I mean, I'm, there have to be some situations where they differ, uh, right? But if, but that's not just true across possible worlds. That's true within this possible world, right? I mean, there are situations where presumably the Kantian and the act utilitarian do differ in what outcome they give. And both of those properties, um, my way of putting it, both of them are evaluative properties that um, uh, are instantiated. The question is, which one is the moral one? Which one is the one that we really, that has the moral force on us? And that's the epistemological question that I think is still very difficult. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna I interrupt. Do you wanna say something, Wilson? Just, uh, you good? Okay, uh, uh, I know we are all very tired and uh, I should a have, him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mainly the target, I imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah the target's yeah. been talking a long time. <laughs> yeah, um, and by the way, I should have thought that when I, uh, I mean, we all, right, when we just had this idea of putting a lot of philosophers together that we would go over time, right? But anyways, uh, uh, in respect to all those uh, people on YouTube who sent questions, we selected, I think, three questions, and we're going to go uh, quickly through them, but that's going to be the last part of this meeting, so. Uh, Sounds good. Uh, all right, I'm going to call uh, Gabriel. Uh, who is our backstage man, right? Welcome, Gabriel. He's going to read the questions. Okay, it's been terrific so far. Very exciting debate. It's a shame to be here controlling form instead of focusing on consent. But anyways, first question, I'll, I mean, being a target on Mind Brazil Brainstorms, a hard Uh, as a hard ball because beyond the debaters, we also have a very qualified audience. Uh, first question is from Andrea Bath. Uh, he's a professor at the Federal Un uh, University of Minas Gerais um, and had his PhD by the University of Sheffield. Um, he asks, Joe, in your illuminating paper, Demonstrative Thought, you defend a view according to which mental type demonstratives work as pointers to perceptual representations of features of objects. And you write that in no way in your account can a type demonstrative itself be seen as a concept of anything or a way of conceptualizing anything. Is, is the disagreement between you and people who write about demonstrative concepts, mostly terminological, what do you take a concept to be? And he goes on, Give, given a broadly Fodorian view of concepts, for instance, could mental words that work as pointers and that have their content given, but what they point to, what they point to be considered as legitimate denizens of the word of concepts? That's the question from Andre. Okay, I'm not... Uh... So I, the, way, the kind of structure I had in mind in, uh, in that paper was that there's a thought. And so, so the, 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 the example I started with in the paper was uh, there's a fly buzzing around you that's really annoying, right? And you say that fly, right? 
Um, you don't have to point, but you know, that fly is really annoying. And so I was trying to think about, okay, let's take very seriously. We've got a representational theory of thought. Um, so there's some, something like a mental sentence in your head that has a, a, a um, you know, subject object uh, structure and the that is a demonstrative element in the thought. And then the question is, can that that, in the fly case, you're picking out an object and that wasn't meant to be problematic, but people try to use the same kind of structure to say, that's where we get our conception of perceptual properties. So I was thinking of um, um, people who worry about the space of reasons and how you can get thoughts about what's going on in the sensorium into cognition, right? And with the idea that in cognition, that is, you have to um, you have to have concepts, but your but there is no concept of particular shades of color and stuff like that. And so there's this move, McDowell, that's what I'm thinking of, um, uh, and, and, and others to say, oh, it gets in by way of the demonstrative. That is, you pick it out as a demonstrative. And all I was really trying to say is, yeah, so let's imagine what that structure might look like. So you've got a, a, a thought in your cognitive space which has a demonstrative in it and then it predicates something of it is annoying we're not worrying about that or no or no, actually i had in mind uh, with color uh you know that's the color i want to paint my house when you see a house you know uh on the street and you say yeah yeah that's the color i want to paint my house so what's going on well there is this demonstrative but what's it pointing at what i was trying to say is it's not in some sense you can't see it as pointing directly at the type color, that doesn't really make sense. What makes sense is you have to already have perceptually processed the color to the point that you have a representation of the color in your perceptual system, and then you're pointing at that. But that means that the, the quality of the color has to already be there so you know what you're pointing at. It already has to be in your mind. So the de demonstration can't be what brings it into your mind. That's the point that I was trying to make there. Now, to the extent that there are lots of kind of verbal semantic debates about what you count as a concept and what you count as a representation, what you count as conceptual, I agree that, you know, if somebody wants to call that a demonstrative concept, that's fine. My claim is, is that if you have that model of it, it won't do the work that a number of philosophers have tried to make it do in very, and that's what the burden of the paper at the end was, was to show that there are three different jobs that people have thought demonstratives can actually do, demonstrative concepts can do, that this model would not allow them to do. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so th uh, that's, well, at this stage of the game, that's as much as I can say. <laughs> okay, Gabriel, the second one. You're a mute. The next question comes from Professor Roberto Horacio from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it says, Joe, you seem to claim that if the why question really does make no sense anymore, and the case of explanatory gap, yet you don't give up. You insist that the question of how is it possible intelligibility is still meaningful, and you argue that the intuition of distinctiveness relies on the mode of access to the qualitative character of experience, namely what he calls acquaintance. Since there is no physical explanation for the acquaintance-based mode of access to the qualitative character of sensory experience, you claim abductively that the inference to the best explanation is that a real ontological gap underlies the intuition of distinctiveness. However, 
you have the Nagel's alternative account, antipathetic fallacy. The idea is that special first personal phenomenal concepts by housing faint and vivid copies of phenomenal qualities involves the experience sympathetically as if the feelings were present, while physical concepts leave out the experience and the feelings. This is playing our natural resistance accepting my brain identity or my brain supervenience. What you have to say about Nagel's proposal? Yeah, um, in a way, I, I would come back to something I said to Terry early on about self-presenting modes of presentation, um, because in a certain way, I think that's what's going on here, is that, um, so I'm, I, in the, I know the Nagel thing was, I think, in a footnote, actually, um, as I remember it. Uh, and um, But I'm most familiar with the presentation of that point as, as it was presented by David Papineau in his paper, I think, called The Antipathetic. Uh, in fact, I think in the same book that Terry quoted from earlier, it was in that uh, Metzinger volume. Um, so this idea that when you use phenomenal concepts, you're somehow putting yourself into the state. And um, whereas when you use third person concepts, you're not. And that's why you have so much trouble seeing how they could be the same thing. Strikes me as it begs the question. And the reason I think it begs the question is, why should being in the state make any difference? Again, if you have a functionalist account of what it is to entertain a, a concept or a representation, part of the whole idea is that the uh, physical realization sort of drops out, right? Um, the mere fact that you're using the same physical state to represent something as you're using to, um, as you would be in if you were in the same state, strikes me as, you know, maybe a, a nice, um, efficient feature of the brain, but to its cognitive mechanisms, it should make no difference. And the way I put it was, I said, physical presence isn't psychological or cognitive presence, right? Now, if you're going to add, no, but the feelings are there, well, then I want to know what a feeling is. Don't appeal to the feeling being there to explain why it's different from this other representation that doesn't have a feeling. If you can't tell me what's distinctive about a feeling, which involves an experiencing of something and not merely an instantiating of it. And it strikes me that the antipathetic fallacy, uh, not fall well, the antipathetic fallacy argument, right, which is supposed to make the world safe for materialism, can't really capture what the difference between experiencing a state is and merely instantiating it. Um, but and anyway, that that's why I've never been fond of that, of that of that way to go. Okay, uh, and we have we have a, a third question from a um, master's student from the University of São Paulo, Victor Shaw. He he asks you uh, to share a little bit more of your thoughts on avoiding. Uh, the epiphenomenalist consequences of his <laughs> of your views. What a way to go out. Um, uh, <clears throat> look, um, so the view I have in general, the sort of overall framework, what I what I what Joe Levine thinks consciousness is um, here <laughs> uh, is very much an emergentist view of the kind that Terry was. Uh, alluding to earlier. So I want to say there's a cognitive system, re, cognitive systems realized in the brain in the way that, you know, realization works. And it writes, as it were, it, it's constantly updating what's going on in the, what is the world like? There's a constant updating from perception, belief formation and stuff. But it, think of it as at every moment, we actually have, as it were, a running narrative of what the world is uh, around us is like. And I don't mean like in a phenomenal sense, just what's true of it. 
Okay. Um, and I think the emergence comes in when there is some kind of basic psychophysical law of nature, which as it were, translates that entire narrative and even the belief system too, because, and this is where I'm a little on board with cognitive phenomenology, into, as it were, a movie that is determined by the underlying cognitive system. So what bothers me about, and, and that, and the epiphenomenalism of just, is the painfulness of the pain actually making me move my hand as opposed to the underlying um, receptors and the uh, uh, nociceptors and all the other stuff that's supposed to be involved, <clears throat> which then gets reflected in the experience of pain. That's actually not the apathy phenomenalism I'm that worried about. Maybe I should be, but I'm not. <clears throat> I'm worried about where do I get this very idea of acquaintance? If, if, if the whole conscious store, conscious theater is as it were a reflection of putting into a, a movie, as we might say, from a script that my brain is writing, where did my brain get the part of the script about acquaintance? And why, why, where do I get this? How am I in a position to write philosophy papers about acquaintance? Um, and that's the problem that has been bedeviling me. And one way it seems to me to go to um, uh, quiet those worries, if not get rid of them entirely, <clears throat> is to say something like the following. It really only is a problem if there really are possible worlds where all that script could be going on and no movie. Because then you've got this problem about why don't, you know, then you've got the problem that Cotty Baylog and others have always been posing is, look, doesn't the zombie have the very same reasons to give the arguments that you give? And that's always been a very difficult issue, I think, um, for, uh, for the um, emergentist or the anti-materialist, um, <clears throat> and especially if they deny supervenience. So I would like to get rid of that possibility. I would like to say there's something very deep in nature, a metaphysical part of the metaphysical structure of nature that actually makes this informational uh, story um, connected to how it's experienced without saying, so they're ultimately the same thing. That's what I want to do. That's where I'm saying I think I need a better metaphysical picture to allow me to do that. And that's where my thought has been going at this point. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, it's about uh, time to end this, right? <laughs> so that's what, I, I, that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, first, I want to thank very much everybody watching us on YouTube because it has been a an almost four years long meeting. So, uh, and people endured up to now, which is amazing. And, and I, I wanna thank particularly the ones who sent questions. We left actually some of the questions uh, out because we don't really have enough time anymore. Uh, but I wanna thank you anyway for sending questions and watching us all this time. And obviously I wanna uh, thank particularly you, the guests, because you made this uh, what it was, an amazing meeting, really an amazing meeting. Uh, I followed like uh, uh, jumping in the discussions a few times, but then I was so much concerned about time that I didn't do it uh, because a lot of the things being discussed here, they, they really kind of moved me in. Uh, uh, you made it really an interesting meeting. So I want to thank you very much, all of you. So I'm going to go personally now. I want to thank you, Charles Silbert. I want to thank you, Rodrigo. Uh, I want to thank you, Wilson. I want to thank you, Terry Horrigan. And I want to thank especially our target, <laughs> Joe Levin. Thank you very much for making the first uh, uh, Mind Brazil brainstorms what it was. So thank you very much. OK, well, thank you, everybody. This was wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I guess we're going to end the transmission right now. And uh,